All of the food we eat and much of the clothing we wear comes from plants and animals that are raised on farms. Farms are different in type, in size, and even in name. Welcome to Barn Talk, homegrown edition. What happens at the barn stays in the barn until now. We're going to let it all out for you, for you guys. Our guest today is a former corn-fed NFL offensive lineman who played 13 years with the Baltimore Ravens and was an eight-time Pro Bowler, seven-time All-Pro, and Super Bowl champion. He was also awarded the Baltimore Ravens Ring of Honor Award and was also inducted to the NFL's 2010s All-Decade team. He played college football at the University of Iowa, and he spent his entire career career with the Ravens. He started 166 out of his 177 games as a pro and only gave up 20 sacks over his 13-year career. I am so freaking excited to do this episode today. I grew up an NFL football fan my whole life, and I think this will be a really, really fun and interesting episode. But before we get into that, got to pay the fee. Sawyer can barely contain himself, uh, <laughs> and for due for due reason, I'm really excited too. Uh, we just ask that you guys share this show out, um, share it with your friends, family, coworkers, um, anything you can do to help us out. Give us a review on Spotify or Apple. We're for the size of this podcast, we are overwhelmed with the number of reviews and the number of good comments we've had. Tell us what you think. Uh, we'll have a Q&A coming up soon, so send your questions and comments to uh, barntalkshow at gmail.com. And um, one thing I do want to say, a big shout out to Jason Egley, a former guest of the show and a friend of ours, because without him, this probably wouldn't have uh, happened. And it's just a great example of relationships you just never know how a relationship is going to uh, benefit you, and he's the one that introduced us to our guest today. So without any further ado, let's get it started. Marshall cool. Yonda, welcome yeah. to Barn Talk. Yeah, buddy. Thanks for coming down and spending your time with us this morning. Yeah, glad to be here. place is pretty awesome. It well, uh, takes me back, too, for sure. We had, a, we had a barn like this growing up, and it's uh, like you guys have done a lot of work. It's, uh, it's pretty cool. Well, we appreciate it. It's been a work in progress for I sure. Bet. We could turn the heat way up and throw some bales around if that, you know, give you a little Get nostalgia. Some, yeah, yeah, no <laughs> doubt. Yeah, we could uh, we could create some work in here real quick. We still got <laughs> yeah. some straw bales. Yep, yeah. there you go. Yeah. Wire tied, no less. Dang, wire tied too. So, uh, yeah, just give us a little bit of history. You know, everybody knows you went to the NFL, but I don't think many yep. people know that you grew up on a dairy farm. So kind of talk a little bit, rough sem- summary of journey from the farm to the NFL. Yeah, sure. So we, um, I grew up on a family farm, um, five miles north of Anamosa. Um, you know, my childhood was, uh, you know, my parents, uh, milked around a hundred head of cows, dairy cows, Holstein cows. So just, you know, it was a way of life, right? We grew up on a, you know, quarter mile lane and our farm was surrounded by a bunch of, uh, you know, pine trees and, uh, and, you know, that was, uh, it was just me and my sister and, and, and my parents. Right. And, uh, just growing up on the farm, it was uh, it was awesome, right? You know, I didn't did, didn't know any other way of life, right? Oh. And uh, so we um, we milked cows, um, and it was my dad and my uncle Amps that uh, st- that uh, stuck around from their generation. Them were the two uh, brothers that stayed and farmed, right? So uh, and then um, Amps and Joni, and they have uh, Ben and Alice, and um, for um, for their kids as well. So it was my uncle and my dad, and they you know right on the same road, right? Like you know quarter yep. mile apart. And um, it was my parents and Amps, and uh, so they, uh, they Amps took care of the pigs. My mom and dad did the dairy cows, and they also row cropped, right? So that was their that was their means. And uh, and my grandpa and grandma uh, Lawrence and Dorothy lived, you know, just right down the road too. You know, it was the yep. old school like. You know, within a radius of like two miles was uh, their entire family, yep. right? And it was the entire family farm. Three generations, right yep. there. Yeah. So you know, so um, it was awesome, right? Like uh, a lot of hard work. Um, you know, our parents, uh, you know, instilled in us. You know, we had calf chores. Me and my sister, we took care of the, the baby calves, right? So we'd get the claustrum milk from the uh, from the um, 
from the milk room in the morning, bring down, carry down the five gallon buckets down to the calf condos. And we fed the calves in the morning and then after school too, you know, so we had to do chores before school, which was, you know, didn't like it as a kid, right? Why are we doing this? You know, why me, right? As a kid, of course, yep. you know, you got, uh, you know, you can find every excuse, you know, to, to get out of work or whatnot, but, uh, but it was awesome, right? We had, uh, such a great upbringing and, uh, I feel like you have to get a lot older to appreciate, you know, that way of lifestyle and how that just wasn't a common lifestyle for a lot of kids. Right. So I just, I knew how to work, you know, um, and that was something that, uh, you know, just as I continued in life, right. It was just something that I fell back on no matter what I knew how to put in a good day's work. My parents instilled that in me, uh, respectful, you know, and, and, uh, and it was just great. You know, I, um, I had a really good support system growing up. My parents were, uh, you know, the bedrock of my life. Right. Yep. So, so yeah, well, um, transitioning. So we sold our cows in 2000. So then we, um, and we had built some hog confinements in the nineties. Uh, so we had hog confinements in the nineties, uh, sold our cows in 2000. Um, my mom went to work at a factory, uh, ADM, and then my dad still, um, you know, row cropped and continued. And then, um, they, uh, and eventually, um, got some hog finishers. And now like, um, now they're basically my cousin, Ben, uh, took, took the farm over. Um, he's the one out of our generation that stayed. So he's the full time. He went to college yeah. and came back. Now he farms full time. So Ben's running the show with, uh, his two, uh, his dad and his uncle as his two overseers. So he's yeah. got, he's got a tall, tall task and tall yeah. order, you know, keeping those two guys happy. Um, but they make it work and they're doing a, they're doing a good job. So it's mainly those three. Um, yeah. and so he's doing the, the finishers, um, custom feeding those, and then they run about, oh, it's probably with rented ground and, and own grounds around like 2000 acres of corn and beans. Yeah. So that's what they do now. So, so yeah, so that's the farm now. Um, and then obviously, um, I went to college, uh, you know, was always, you know, playing football and then, um, you know, got to just discover talent in me, you know, that I didn't know I had through that hard work. You know, I just um, was a junior college player and to go from junior college to, you know, just a goal of like playing division one football at Iowa, just to be able to, you know, run out of Kinnick stadium, you know, was like my goal. Right. And to, back to in do black. that, what's that? Run out of the tunnel back in black style. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. It was still one of my fondest memories of football. Yep. So, and then to continue to, um, just uh have success and continue to uh opportunities just kept opening for me right just through uh through that hard work and then at, at iowa really you know they really taught me kind of the, the the fundamental basis of like mental toughness and preparation and and really setting goals and really just attacking every single day down to the fine details and man that really just like put me on a path of like of a just a, a an upward trend of like getting being a better player being a better um you know just daily daily task of really just fine tuning you know um as a football player getting stronger getting faster um and learning about you know just the way you think in your mind so and then like i said i got drafted to the ravens in uh, 2007 um got to play 13 years with the ravens i got to stay my entire time there which was uh important to me um we got to win a super bowl in 2012 um we had some really good teams um was just fortunate to be drafted by the Ravens, right? Like to be able to, you don't know where you're going to get drafted. I was super thankful just to be even like drafted, right? Well, to go to the Ravens was such a, uh, just a slam dunk as far as um, a great franchise, stable, you know, uh, just uh, their goals are aligned with winning and, and like the long term. And so like we had a lot of success and won a lot of, a lot of football games, a lot of good teams and uh, just met so many really good um teammates along the way right got to meet yeah. so many uh close close people so like in my life most of my my really good friends are my teammates that i had just yeah. because like you're kind of forged in that like highly stressful environment where you really get to know what a guy's made of you know what i mean mm -hmm. whether a guy talks about it well i'm all about actions i'm you know i'm a father now i i say you know you know I don't care what you say. I want to see what you do and show yep. me, you know, through what you do is how I'm going to, how I'm going to perceive you and how I'm going to learn from you. So like guys, I got the, I thought who they were, you know, when the, when the, you know, when things got really stressful, you found out if they were really true to who they said they were. Right. Yep. And a lot of times guys, what they said didn't actually show what their yep. actions were. Right. So, yep. so my, my really good buddies were forged in the, in those uh, stressful environments of football. So, yeah. so yeah, I played 13 years with the Ravens. I, my last season was 2019. Uh, we were 14 and two. We were first place in the AFC, uh, this number one seed in the AFC. We completely laid an egg. Uh, we got a first round by laid an egg uh, to Tennessee and uh, had to play my last game where we were like heavy favorites and the entire town's painted purple. 
and uh, and Tennessee's like you know heavy underdogs, yep. and we go in there and we don't play well, and uh, Derrick Henry gets rolling, <laughs> and, our, and our offense were sputtering, and uh, and they beat us, and uh, you know bring my family out on the field after the game because it was our last game. It was my I knew I was retiring, so it was tough to. Uh, to have that last game be that way, but that's life, right? Like you don't like every, you don't get to, uh, you know, everybody doesn't get to retire, you know, winning and, and yep. how you want to. So, but you know, I got to retire as a Raven. Um, and, uh, and that was, uh, like I said, it was a great ride. So, and then the last three years, um, I've been, uh, you know, my family's my number one priority. We have three young kids, um, sixth grade, fourth grade, second grade. So, um, you know, being a father to them and, and, and uh, just raising them the right way and then spending time with family. So, like, you know, those are kind of the goals. And I've been helping uh, my dad and my uncle and Ben. I've been helping them farm in the fall. And then I'll help them periodically when I can. Like, I'm going to help dad bed cattle, some cattle tomorrow. But uh, but I help them in the fall mainly. Like, a lot of times with our kids in the weekends and, and – yep. We bought a house and some acres and stuff like that. I've been busy with that, but love to get back and help them. I run the grain cart in the fall, yep. get bossed around on the grain cart. You know, <laughs> like we got the radios in the tractor and dads yep. in the car. Where are you? Saying, Come on, Marshall. I'm full. All right. I got to, you know, I got to yep. get dumped before Where I make the at? next pass. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, get back here. So and my dad and my uncle like things done a certain way and yep. bo- both are, you know, so we, it's, it's pretty, pretty fun. I really enjoy, uh, getting to spend that time with my dad and being on the farm where I grew up, uh, you know, just a lot of memories. There's a lot of, uh, yep. just, uh, gr- fond memories of my family, um, you know, making it work and, uh, and putting in that time. So like, I cherish that time with my dad because I know that like, you know, as a, when you get older and I'm still young, you do stuff now that you can't do 10 years from now. Right. You know, my dad's getting older and, and, uh, you just, you're prioritizing all the time. So, so that's where I am now. You know, our kids are in school and we're busy with sports every single weekend and the youth, uh, youth sports rat race. We're doing that and we're loving it. Uh, the kids are having fun and, and we're supporting them and, uh, and we're there for our kids and yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that's you thought you a, were busy you, when you were playing ball, you thought you were so busy and now you got <clears> three kids. You're like, Holy cow! How yeah, did I exactly. how did I get all that done too? Now I'm really yeah. busy. No yeah. doubt, I'm busier now than when I was playing for sure. Yep. So yeah, you you uh, those kids, like you said, I mean, I didn't say I said we were not going to get caught in the youth sports like uh, trap. Yep. But we we're we we're like we we're in the thick of it, and we it were completely caught. You. We were caught in the wheel by yeah. far. We can't get out. Like we're locked in. Like the yep. wheel's spinning, and you just gotta you just hold gotta on. Go. You just gotta go. Yep. Yeah. So well, yeah. let's go back. Yeah. yeah. Let's dissect it because yeah, yeah, that was great. But yeah. well, so uh, it's great that you brought that up because you growing up. My guess is. Maybe you didn't. They didn't have youth sports like they do today. No, like exactly. When 100%. when was the yeah. first? And were you a were you a multi sport like through high school? Did you play? Yep, I was. Yeah, yeah, I played. I played basketball. My uh, I played basketball, football. Obviously, I did track for a couple of years in high school. I played baseball up until like seventh yep. grade. So like I was multi sport yeah. athlete. And then yeah, I didn't play football until seventh grade. Right. Yep. You know they That's didn't have uh, they didn't have uh, pee wee league and, and yeah pee wee league yep. and and uh, red zone football. You know yep. flag football now and stuff. So, um, youth sports has just completely changed, right? It's, uh, yeah. you know, things are much more organized and structured and they start at a super early level. So it's just, um, and then, you know, you're, you're caught in this trap where, uh, the other kids are doing it, having fun and they want to proceed. And then yeah. your kids do it and they have fun and they enjoy it. And you see the smiles and, and sports, you know, are so good for kids too, you know, where they yep. teach, you know, so much about life, right. Yeah. You know, and, and all that stuff. So, um, so we're, the opportunities are there to do more. And like I said, you end up doing so much where you're, you're like I said, you question yourself, like, are we doing too much? Right. Yeah. And, and, and it's legit too, because you know, there's not as much family time on the weekends cause you're running and gunning. But, uh, but you know, the old, the parents that are just out of it, they do say, you know, it's a definitely a season of life and, and it's just super busy right now. Like when our oldest gets to be driving he can drive himself to yep. practices and, and then you don't have as much you get more just like of your high school sports and not like yeah. the the club sports and all that stuff. It it does uh, tone down some, but it's just those opportunities weren't there when I was younger, you know. Yeah. And, mm-hmm. and that's just the way the the times have changed. So when you started playing, yep. Um, what what was your what did you play through high school? What was your position? Yeah, through high yeah. School? I I was never. I was always a big kid. Like so, like I was uh, I was always a lineman my entire time. Yeah. People are always like usually like offensive lineman or defensive lineman, usually you played a skilled position. Like when you were younger, maybe yep. you were a lot smaller then. I was always a big kid. So I played O-line and D-line my whole way, yep. you know, and then I played uh, D-line, like I said, in high school as well. I, and then I just obviously, 
when I was here at college, I was like, all right, you're not, you know, fast enough to play D-line anymore. You just focus on O-line now. So, you know, I was, uh, I was O-line from college all the way out. So yeah. O-line, D-line. I'll you know? tell you a good, I'll tell you a good, uh, bigger kid story. So when my kids were young, um, yep. I was volunteer coach, you know, yep. me and a buddy of mine that I actually, that worked with me at my old job. And, um, we had this kid and he was actually, he was in your class, wasn't he? We won't say Depends who on he the is. kid. <laughs> well, there were some, there were some big guys, big though. Big kid, yeah. big yep. kid. Yep. And uh, you know, you, you don't really, you're not like a legit coach. You have that one night orientation at the Y, and they say, okay, you know, we need volunteers, and yep. these are your kids, and you know, yep. get them, introduce them. So we're going yep. through plays and all that, and then um, we were waiting on. I think we were waiting on some kids to start. So the guy that was coached with, he's like, let's just make them run. So we had to run around the field, you know? Yep. And this one kid, biggest kid on the team, he runs about a quarter of the way, and then he just turns. He comes across, he runs up to my buddy, and he goes, Coach, hey, uh, I'm just here to uh, knock people down, so uh, do I need to run? And it's like, as a, a, like, what do you say to that? And he just goes... Nope, you're fine. Just go get a drink. <laughs> but I, I always remember that. Oh, he yeah. had it and he had it figured out. Yep. He was like, yep. I'm, meant I'm for just this. here to hit people. Yep. 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 Move them out oh, of the yeah. way. Oh yeah, yep. for sure. I did not like running either as a as a bigger kid. That was your like that was your like worst uh yep. worst nightmare was running long distance, right? You're carrying that weight around for sure. But I'm surprised the coach didn't make him uh, still at least run some. But hey. If we were know. better coaches, we would have. But yeah, I no, think hey, it threw hey. him off guard so much that he just had the nerve yep. to walk up there and say that he just looked at me and he goes yep. just go get a drink, yep. go get a drink. <laughs> take a break yep. oh man so uh yeah. i want to go back on the farm a little bit you have a you have a really good farm story that you always remember or a, just a memorable story on the farm that you can think back or on worst yeah. worst chore worst yeah. chore okay like uh well yeah well yeah a couple things come to mind like Fondest memory is probably like harvest season, right? Like during the fall, yep. like when like they're getting the combine out, you know, and uh, and getting stuff ready to go, and like just um, you know combining corn or combining beans. It didn't matter. Like running, dad getting like the trucks ready. Like we ran like uh, like an old Chevy pickup with a straight box on yep. it, you know, and they and they hauled, and then they had the wagons back then too. So like just that season, like you know where the leaves are turning and you're combining corn and the sun's setting, yeah. you know, just that that. Uh, setting of like of uh, of that and, and obviously like my dad you know super fired up like they're <laughs> they're like fired up times are yep. planting season and harvest season yep. right like so like seeing like my dad and and mom too obviously like fired up about that season and um and just like you know just it's taking in those snapshots right of like yep. of like i said or you know and you know memories of uh you know, getting like the, the truck stuck one night. Right. And then, you know, having to pull it out with chains and the tractor, like, you know, in the, you know, yep. when they ran into the dark back then they used to run in the dark. We don't do that too much anymore because the, <laughs> the crew is getting to be a little bit older too, you know? Yeah, so, yeah. um, but yeah, just, I would say harvest time on the farm was an exciting time. Um, worst, worst, uh, worst job for us was, uh, pitching calf condos. So after, you know, we fed those baby calves, you know, you would, you know, bet them a straw, right. And you would bet them and bet them. And then when you would, you know, move them, we never moved the condo and we couldn't fit a skid loader in there. So it was just a pitchfork and, you know, you'd Dig bring the out. skid loader with the bucket, you know, to that single condo, pitch it out, move it to move it over. And then you would do, you know, move it yeah. with the skid loader bucket. So, so pitching out calf condos for like me and my sister was one of our like jobs we didn't like. And you, you know, you couldn't, you could barely fit in there, yep. and, you know, getting the pitchfork in there and trying to move it around in a tight space that just wasn't, uh, wasn't fun. So those, yeah, that, that comes to mind. Especially as you as a big guy, I'm yeah. sure that was not fun yeah, at all. For sure. Yeah. Yep. No doubt. No doubt for sure. So yeah. When I was a kid, we hated power washing. Yep. And then when we would get done, my dad would come over and he'd inspect your work, you know? Yep. And my brother, my middle brother, he would always try to, he'd try to squeak by Yep. So he wouldn't flip the panels over because they were they were gates. They weren't solid dividers. So you had to wash them both sides. Then you had to flip them because you, and he would always try to not flip them. Yep. Yep. Or for sure. or he would start doing them all and then he'd stop Gradually. thinking that my dad would grab one that he'd done and be like good. Yep. But he always had the knack, <laughs> and then he'd just turn around and look at us and go, "Do it again." Yep. <laughs> no doubt for sure. Yep. Yeah. Oh yeah. 
And that's a good thing, right? Like, you know, they, uh, my dad was a stickler too, right? You know, he's uh, one of the things done the right way. And there was like a certain way to, you know, I just like I say, every gate on our farm had a different way that you chained it, right? Yeah. Like depending on the gate and how it was bent and how it was like, you know, attached yeah. and stuff like that. So, oh, this one, we loop the chain around this way and then we use a little, you know, quick connect carabiner. And then now this one, we got to, you know, wrap it two times around the, the pipe and all that stuff. Yep. So all those like, you know, to, and, and like, so my dad was like, you know, you do it this way, this way, this way. Yep. So very, um, you know, very set in their ways, you know, yep. routine. Yeah. Yep. So you get, so you get doing the farm till seventh grade, and then you get introduced to football, and you're like, "All right, I like this." Yep. Get into high school, and this might this might have happened in JUCO too. But was there a moment in high school or JUCO when you were playing where you kind of thought to yourself, "Damn, okay, I got a shot." Like I I I did this, I got a shot at maybe going to the NFL. Was there a moment, or was it kind of just progressive? As yeah, you just that the the moment for the NFL was probably still well, it was at Iowa. Yeah, when I got like my senior year at Iowa, because like you know you were I always knew that like I was a bigger kid and I loved like like my um my like the thing I loved about football is just being physical. Like I was a physical kid. I loved like playing sports and and rough house and just anything yep. that was like you know running into people and tackling people like and just being rough. Like I loved that life. So like football was my sport for sure. But um. You know, I was always a, a good athlete in, in, in high school and had good – I wouldn't say good athlete. I would say good football player, right? But uh, but big kid, loved to be physical. But um, NIAC, it was always – junior college, always about getting just to Iowa, right? Like I was trying to get to Division One. That was my goal. So – and I was doing well and having success. It wasn't It wasn't thinking about the NFL. It was, it was trying to get to Iowa. And then, like I said, uh, at Iowa, when I got there, I was, you know, buried on the depth chart right away for about six months. Like So I was like, hey – like I'm just trying to get to be a starter here to try to do that is is a tough thing to do, right? It's not yeah. it's not easy. So like everything was like kind of stepped at a time, and then I started my junior year, and then you go into your senior year, and I'm playing. I'm like, man, this is awesome. I'm like having some sex success, and then I I got invited to the Senior Bowl, and when you get invited to the Senior Bowl, and I didn't know this until people say. About 90% of people that get invited to the Senior Bowl make an active roster in the NFL that fall. So that was my light bulb. Like, man. 90% of these guys that get invited to the senior bowl and make an active roster, I got a chance to play in the NFL. So that was like kind of like the moment, like, wow, like I have a, I possibly have a, an opportunity to play in the NFL. And that like, you know, it's an amazing, like, you know, feeling and accomplishment. And you're getting calls from like agents at this point, like uh, soon after that agents start picking up on that as well. They're going to, they have the list of the senior bowl invites and they yep. start going down their holes of networking and, and, and calling people. So super exciting time. And, uh, and you don't realize, you know, all those, all that hard work and opportunities that you're making the right decisions, that's all mattering, right? And now it's starting to really like, you know, take off and, and, and stuff. So it was, uh, it was an exciting time in my life for sure. Yeah. How, uh, how, cause I've heard this, I've, you know, I got friends or buddies that played football at Iowa. Yep. Uh, they were on the O-line, you know, mm -hmm. and they always talk about, and you kind of mentioned it when you first started, how, impactful coach Ferentz and coach Doyle were on their development as a player and a man. So yeah. can you talk a little bit about that? Like, I know you had an amazing foundation, you know, yep. working on the farm, you knew how to work, Correct. but then you get there and these guys are some of the best in the business with coming to developing players. So yeah, kind yeah, of talk sure. about that. Yeah, no, like, and like I said, I had that foundation of like the farming background of, hardworking kid was not afraid to work and put that work in. And, um, and like I said, raised with two great parents that, you know, showed me the way, but like, I was a very raw football player, like even for in junior college, like I was raw, like I didn't really like the fine details of technique and fundamentals of football was like exposed to me at Iowa. Right. Finesse was not your middle name. Correct. No, like I'd like go block that guy, point and block that guy. I could get in front of that guy and block that guy. But you, if I had to tell you how I need to get there, what step, you know, weight placement, hand placement, pad level, all that stuff, no clue about any of that stuff, right? Yeah. But like Iowa and like I said, like Coach Ferentz, you know, and Coach Doyle, they start to fine tune all of that. They break all of that down into like literally your single daily tasks of waking up in the morning to go into to the to the weight room, you know, to go into a speed workout, to you know, what are you drinking for hydration? What are you putting in your body for food? What are you doing for classwork? What time are you lighting for this? Like 
they break everything down and they really start to like teach you how to think in your mind, right? So like all that stuff comes into play. And like I said, you know, and I've said in my retirement speech before too, like, you know, Coach Ferentz and Coach Doyle, they're mentors in my life, right? I wouldn't be, I wouldn't have the success I had in the NFL. And, you know, Coach Ferentz says, well, you know, he was always a really good football player. But like me being able to apply that and the, like the fundamentals and technique really made me like a great player, right? Like I had potential to play in the NFL, but to be the, the success I had wasn't without those guys helping me, right? And, and it's about people helping you. So, you know, Coach Ferentz talked to us every day about decisions that you have to make, right? Like everybody has choices every single day. Mm -hmm. And he would bring up examples of guys that made wrong choices. He would read off the paper, hey, this guy, this athlete did this and this helped him. Or he made this mistake and this just cost him, right? And like he gave examples of success and failure and choices that you have to make, right? As a, as a, as a, a human every day, right? Not just as an athlete, as a human. So like he was a great coach, like an even better like person. He cared about people. Like when you find people in your life that really actually care about you as a, as a person, as a player, you know, as a husband, a father, you know, as a friend, you gravitate towards those people and you care, like you want to play for those people. So like Coach Ferentz did that every single day through his leadership and just how he structured the entire Iowa program. And then you add Coach Doyle to the mix where Coach Doyle is with you every day in the weight room. And before every single weight workout, we talk about preparation. We talk about our goals. We talk about why we're here. We talk about during this weight session, what's expected of you, right? In which it is 110% effort, right? That you are expected to do. This is the Iowa way. And this is talked to you every single day for, I was there for two years, every single day, every single weight workout. We're not just going to do it. We're going to talk about it. And we're also going to demand it, right? Like, so like coach Doyle was teaching us mental toughness, which I always had some grit inside of me and like, and some hard work, but like he made us mentally tough, right? Like as far as like making the, the, the tough choices, like when you're outside of the, the building, right? Like eating the right foods and, and getting enough sleep and, and being, being hydrated and, and focusing on getting better as an athlete too, as a player. Like when you're in there and you're lifting weights, let's not just go through the motions. Let's get better. Like you have room to grow. You have room to get faster. So all that dynamic of coach Doyle, teaching us and 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 just making us better every single day compounded right so like so those two guys like caring about people and coach Doyle is the same way like he showed that he cared about you right he would push you and get after you and then he showed you that he cared about you and he loved you right like I mean there was there was love there so like it was it was such a positive environment that like man you just set you on a path like I said where I discovered talent I had no idea that I had, right? Like for if you told me that I was going to play 13 years in the NFL and have that much success when I'm at junior college, that that was in me, I had no idea. You know what I mean? Yeah. I was like, yeah, okay, I'm a good football player. But like to be able to do, have, um, have as much success as I had, it was because of those two guys. You know what I mean? Like those, they really set you on set the path. Yeah, because like – you know, just like in the NFL, guys were like, oh, we know where Marshall's at. You know what I mean? You can say at 710, I'm going to be in the hot tub. And then at 720, I'm going to eat breakfast. And then 730, I'm getting ready for the meeting. And then 740, you know, I'm never late. You know what I mean? I was late, you know, one or two times maybe in 13 years at, uh, uh, with the Ravens, right? Like at Iowa, like I was late twice my first like 10 days at Iowa on campus. I was late twice in the first 10 days. <laughs> Guys make it through the Iowa program five years, like Matt Kroll, like Mike Elgin. They, they're there for five years with their red shirt. Never late one time in five years. Hundreds of workouts, speed workouts, practices, meetings. Never late one time in five years. I was late twice in 10 days. They showed me that if I was going to continue to do this, I was not going to be here for six months with – the way things were going. So I had to make a change in my mind of how I prepared, how I was ready for every single day. And this is how we do things at Iowa, right? Like you being late here, like Mike Elgin talked to me and said, this is unacceptable. Okay. This is not how we do things here. Okay. This is, this is the way we do things. If you're not on board, you're not going to play. You probably won't even be here. Okay. So just, this is the standard. So like, you know, I, that was, you know, tough to take and like, and that, and I, and I felt bad. I let those guys down. 
But I had to look in the mirror at me and say, I got to make better choices. I got to prepare more. And this is, this is the Iowa way, right? So like, although all that stuff was like so huge for me and like, and preparing and, and, and understanding how to attack the day. So like getting like, you know, and that all started with, with coach Ferentz and coach Doyle, you know, and then, you know, my offensive line coach, coach Morgan, Reese Morgan, he was huge in those. Those were the three guys in yeah. Iowa that were my most influential factors, right? He was my old line coach and coach Morgan was, and he was, you know, he was on me every single day and he was definitely a compliment uh, to, to Ferentz and Doyle. You know, yeah. they're just, uh, they're just, the Iowa program is such a, it's about people, right? And, and they care about you and they push you really hard and man, they make you, they make you into men. So like, yeah, yeah it, it was, uh, like I said, I mean, I uh, cherish my time there. Yeah. yeah. And it seems like, it seems like Iowa preps guys for the NFL so well. Yes. You look at George Kittle, you look at TJ Hawkinson, you look at Scherf, you look at Wirfs, you look at you, you look at Linderbaum. Yep. It, they, they think they, they, you sometimes hear Iowa as a factory of pro talent. Well, yep. I've heard, I, and I don't remember who this was that said this, but he said that when he, when he went to the NFL, like the, the strength and conditioning program they had there, like there were guys that came in they weren't used to that. Like they, they, they had to learn that. Yeah. But Iowa was so dialed in to the way they were doing it, whatever team that was, yeah. that it it was so similar that you just felt like you're at home. Okay, you were at home. This is this yes. is. You, they just were able to focus on what they had to do because the the basics were just just like what they what they left. Yeah, correct. So, yes, it was definitely very very similar. The only, the only thing different was the competitiveness, right? The, yeah. the t level, of ta number. the level of talent of like the guys, right. Of how good they were. Yeah. But the good thing was everything else, how you approach the day, how you're, you the choices that you make, you would had already had all that foundation laid to where like, if you could get on the level of their, their competition and that skill level, you were going to succeed, you know, because everything else was already you had already um, been exposed to and learned how to adapt to that and how to how to you know handle that yeah. lifestyle. They had definitely run a, a lot like a, a you know a pro style for sure. Yeah. So because like you see Iowa, like the amount of people there in the NFL for the amount of recruits that they have, it's yeah. crazy, right? You know, like this isn't Alabama, right, where they get these five star athletes. Like they have yeah. a lot of guys in the NFL because of how they have taught these guys how they and prepare them. How they yeah, and then the, the guys. Like, there's very few busts that come out of Iowa. That's the thing. It just feels like they succeed. Yep, for cause sure. Because they just know yep. how, to, how to do it, how to work. Yep. So that's, no doubt. that's awesome. When you, so you play your last game as a Hawkeye. Yep. But you have all this time between that and when the draft. Yep. And, and you're still, you got to finish school. Yep. Am I right? For sure, yep. You yep. got to, yep. Isn't that, like, what's that like to know, okay, out there, there's the possibility yep. that I could be playing in the NFL, yep. but I'm just a, I'm just a college student and I got to get, I got to get through this. Yep. Yep. Yeah. What was that like? I just, I remember them, you know, preparing us and talking to us about that. Right. Like saying, uh, like what stage of like you're in as far as, um, you know, you're preparing. So you're preparing for the combine usually comes first in February. And then you have your pro day in March at Iowa. And then you have the draft in April. So those things like were stacked, you know, say like, this is first, this is second, this is third. So, you know, early on, and obviously your schooling is, is up there. Very important. Getting your degree was very important, right? Yeah. You know, Coach Ferentz talked about it all the time. Getting your degree is should be just as important as anything you do on the football field. So finish your, your degree getting that done and making that a priority, right? Like making the choices to make sure you're, you're, you're doing everything you need to, to in line to, to get that done. And then you're just preparing, still lifting weights, still going to speed workouts, still preparing for the combine, right? So all that's transitioned into testing, right? So now all of a sudden you're working on 40 yard dashes and pro agilities and 10 yard sprints and, and all the measurable testing, the bench press and all that stuff. So you're, you're testing for the combine. Then you're then you have your own pro day, right? Where the guys, so you're testing again. So it's a big testing phase 
of of you know of the the measurables of all your, your, your you know diving into the the details of of your measurables and your your times so to speak how fast you are you know how explosive you are so and then comes the draft so like you were all laid out you know the the game plan of like day to day right you were still training you know four to five days a week uh, training for that and just preparing right and uh, preparing to to possibly be drafted and if you weren't drafted then getting undrafted and still having an opportunity. So, you know, there was still a big group of guys that were training and, uh, and you were still, you know, you just, it was still, you know, very routine and very similar to the program. Yeah. It was just the, the mechanics of it. The fine details were just a little different, right? Yeah. Just like the, the type of workouts you were doing were just altered, but very still similar, but also exciting too, right? Like you're, you have an opportunity to play in the NFL and like, and you're, you're on this path and, uh, and it's very exciting, right? Like, I just remember being that time, like, okay, you know, I'm finishing school and now I'm going to have an opportunity to play. And since, like I said, they kind of, the senior bowl uh, reference, it's like, you have an opportunity to be drafted. So, um, exciting time in your life and and uh and just trying to you know test well and, and unfortunately i wasn't a good tester so i wasn't like a good bench presser i wasn't like a real fast 40 time like coach ferris talks about all the time like i was not like the, when you seen me in shorts and you seen my measurables nothing nothing was like really like like yeah, eye popping maybe charts. it is actually maybe like hey like he doesn't like look the part but my 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 best attribute was that I was a football player, right? Yeah. And I and I had that had that strength on the field. So um so you know it was uh like I said it was an exciting time for sure. Yeah, you you definitely didn't have a lot of downtime no. that you had to sit and no. just contemplate because no. you were in that routine and yep. that had to make it better. So yep. did you have any inkling of what teams were interested in you? You don't because uh, you go to you like when we went to the combine. You have these meetings with all the teams, and um, and they uh, you know the scouts meet with you and they sit down with you and they talk with you. And you just uh, you don't you know just because like uh, every team's needs are different, and then like uh, where they're value evaluating where they have you on their board, right? That's the most important thing, and you'll never know that until actually draft day. Yeah. So um so you don't know, and that's fine, you know, right? You can't control that, so you don't worry about it, right? They teach you that at Iowa all the time, right? Yep. Like if you can't control that, there's no use worrying about it control the controllables exactly yep. right because yep. like yep. some people worry about the the things that they have no control over so like yep. why why burn yourself up by just move on you're focused on what you can affect right now yep. on this day this day this month you know this year all that stuff so mm -hmm. um so yeah they didn't they just uh so when you come draft day you had no idea right so um so like kind of fast forwarding to that right uh you know April's draft day and like the big debate is whether you have a draft party or not right well they had told me that like you know like I said with the senior bowl and then also they did give you a little bit of an inkling I forget what that uh, system is called there's some system where they can give you a possible draft uh, like uh, a round uh, estimate right where you might yeah, go where you if might you're go. gonna go and they said mine was either um, they said either between third and sixth round so they said well and I'm like well if it's third and sixth round, there's only seven rounds. I, then more than likely, I'm going to get drafted. So we, so I, I, I did have a draft party at my mom's house in Iowa City. So we had everybody over, and uh, you know, and, and the back then, it, uh, the first day was the first three rounds. So you know, the first three rounds were that day. Well, still to this day, I still it was uh, it was a awesome day very memorable experience but i didn't get drafted till like 9 45 at night well we started you know our draft party right at like 11 a.m right yeah so by right. like 9 45 at night either everybody's tired and you know this is dragging on you know and yep. uh, and it kind of put the put the pressure like uh like that it shouldn't have been like we shouldn't have had a, had a party you know right because i'm yep. happy uh you know happy to be drafted but like everybody waiting around till 9 45 at night was tough on everybody and, right? right and like the, the pressure and then you start seeing possibly linemen drafted ahead of you were like hey well i thought i was better than this guy i thought this yeah. i thought all those like the stuff that's not important all of a sudden kind of the pressure of everybody being there for you and right. then you're not getting drafted right well still i'm very fortunate i'm still very grateful that like i went in the third round right that still yeah. was a, a huge deal to me but just mm -hmm. having the party puts that extra pressure yeah. on there which shouldn't have been there and and you know nobody's batting 100 percent. you know I, like i said it was uh it was still a good time and and it was still a, a memorable experience and you know and and getting the call you know from uh you know it was from uh coach billick at the time the head coach you know and yeah. and uh 
you know, you're, we're going to draft you the Ravens. Uh, you know, how, how does that sound? You know, and it's just like, man, you know, it's like, sounds great. I'm excited for the, for the opportunity and the, okay, sounds good. You know, we're going to pick you we'll and, 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 you know, we'll see you soon. Right. Yep. So like, you know, having that experience and know, like I was going to the Ravens and they were 14 and two the year before. I'm like, this is awesome. Like, and, uh, and also coach Ferentz played, right. uh, coached at, at Baltimore. That yeah. is a special, so that's a special relationship. And a lot of people, that's a really weird a lot of people don't realize how, like, the Ravens was the demise of the Browns. Of the Browns, yes. they and, moved, and yes. so many guys. I mean, Pete, if you're a football fan, you know the story of yep. all those coaches Saban. that were at the Belichick. Browns. Yes, yes, it was a, it was a, they were stacked. They were yeah. stacked. It was amazing. They were on the way. I felt like to winning a Super Bowl. Yeah, but. and then the rug got pulled out, and then that ended up yep. being the beginning of the Baltimore Ravens. But yep. I just thought. How cool to end up there because of the history, yeah. you know. Yeah. Did that add pressure? Do you feel like that added pressure to you that they knew kind of the reputation of Ferentz or did it kind of no, put I think, you at no, ease? It, it I think it helped me because, like, Coach Ferentz, obviously who he is, right, wherever he goes, like, you know, he is who he is and people really, you know, like him and in positive experience from him. When I went to the Ravens, they're like, oh, yeah, you came from Iowa. Coach Ferentz is your your coach. Yeah, we loved Kirk, right? Like, mm -hmm. you know, the trainers, the the people that worked there that when when they were still there when Coach Ferentz was there, they're like, hey, they liked me just because I was I was coached by Coach Ferentz. Yeah. So it was one of those deals where like I you had even, a little bit even of credit. before I walked in the building, I had a uh, a good uh good um tie Reputation. to my name from Coach Ferentz, which yeah. is yeah. understandable, right? right? And so so yeah, it definitely it helped me for sure. Yeah. Uh this is kind of a fun question, but was there any rookie hazing you had to get go in get into your first year? Did you have to do something carry pads for the vets? There was, uh, you know, there was rookie dinner back then, in which they don't. I don't know if they still do it now. We carried pads for the vets for sure after practice. Yep, and I like, and I I considered myself, and this was before like hazing really. You know, like the the aftermath where guys took it too far, yeah. and then it got like pretty pretty much like you can't Ninsed. do it anymore. But right. back in 07, 2007, you could still do that stuff, right? And it wasn't nothing, anything bad. Like right, like we had to carry pads in. And here's the biggest thing, though. The guys that got taped to the goalpost and the guys that got thrown in the cold tub were guys when they asked you to carry their pads, they didn't. Oh, I, I'm not doing that for you. I, I'm, you know, I was drafted and and yeah. and I, I'm a grown man and I don't need to carry your pads. You're a grown man, carry your own pads. Yeah. So now like, you're a target. You, what's that? <laughs> now you're a Correct. target. Now you're a target. Now you've just given them. Yep. Oh yeah, here's the you're guy the, that we're gonna get now because he thinks that he he's thinks above. He's, better. he's above carrying somebody's pads off the field, which is yep. no job anyways. Takes zero. Like all it is is like give them, give the old vets their respect. They want you to carry their pads. Carry their pads, okay? Mm -hmm. No big deal. So, like, I I respected the vets when they had when they had small little tasks to do. I did them. You know, yep. what I mean, you had to sing as a rookie, which that was very stressful for sure. <laughs> yeah, because you had to get up, and they still do this at the Ravens, which is great. You know, I mean, it's there's no real consequence for um, not doing it, except you have to do it again. Yeah. So you had to sing, pick out a song and sing, right? And you had to sing in front of the whole team. And it is like for as a rookie, like you're in training camp, you're worried about performing, but you're like, man, like it's it's nervous getting up and singing, right? And never yep. done it like I'm not a choir guy, right? So like <laughs> uh so I sang Kenny Rogers, you gotta know when to hold him. I yeah. sang that yeah. song. <laughs> yeah. And it was great that I I only sang for like 30 seconds. And I was so bad, you know what I mean, singing it, but I knew every word. Like if yep. you missed a word and you you stumbled. You got booed off, again. and then you got to pick a new song. You couldn't sing your fight song. You know, nobody could sing your, your college yeah. fight song. That's too easy. You had to pick something. So I at least knew every word didn't stumble, but I was a terrible singer where they, they kind of like clap you off and like, hey, all right, good job. <laughs> you, sound, you sound terrible, but you know what? You're at least, you got the words right. You've done your preparation. Get yeah. off. And that, that, was my, that was my one time of singing. So, But I was nervous about that for yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Singing as a rookie in front of a gr bunch of grown NFL players, nerve-wracking. Um, carried pads in and then our rookie dinner though our rookie dinner got the bill on that got the bill on that and that stunk but we uh we had a first round pick offensive lineman and he's still a good friend of mine ben grubbs he's from auburn he was taken in the first round i was taken in the third so me and ben split the bill and it was or not split the ben did it was like since he was a first round pick ben was Two -thirds, understanding one -third. he did like 70 30 or 64 or something like yeah. that you know what i mean because he he made he got a lot more which was nice and he didn't have to do that but he did it's just the guy ben is but uh it was a hefty bill 
and people were just ordering stuff. You know what I mean? And it was just the old line. We just did the old line dinner. Yeah. But we had a couple of guys on the old line back then that were just just because they got burnt when they were rookies. Oh, now all of a sudden we have to we yeah. I have to get mine since I got burnt. Well, I yeah. eventually broke that that wheel where like we didn't do rookie dinners anymore because I still felt like we're just why are we doing this? We're just 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 to spend this guy's money that he did work hard for. Mm -hmm. Just uh, you know. Yep. You know, take a two hundred dollar shot, just just order just cause, or order a bottle of Dom Perignon and take yep. it home. You know, spend five hundred dollars yep. for the bottle and take the bottle home. Like, that's going too far. So I broke the mold where we didn't do rookie dinners. Like when I got to be a veteran, just because like I was like, we're only just continuing this habit just because like you know it's the age old where okay if I got done to me, well then yep. this guy's got to have it done to him. Just and it's like pass it's, it's paying the pain forward. Correct. So like yep. so we we broke that wheel, which was nice. And, uh, and, uh, like I said, cause like it was, uh, that sucked. You know what I mean? You were yep. like, dang, this is a lot of money. And it yep. was, you know, so it was like, it sucked. You yeah. Know? So the transition from, from Midwest to East coast, yep. there probably was a little bit of sticker shock in oh. everything. Was there oh, not? For sure. And for sure. you would have been, what, how old were you been? 22? 23. Yeah. 23. Yeah. 23. And so you move you move out there you don't know anybody yep for sure what was that like oh it was a yeah a lot of pressure yeah a lot of pressure and a big just big culture shock just because like you know lifestyle shock i mean yep. i grew up in animosa <laughs> north of animosa on a farm right and yep. animosa is like four thousand people and yep. uh, and i grew up in the country you know and, and that and then you know i played college at mason city you know so yep. that was a little bit bigger of a city and then iowa city you know I'm just saying smaller towns, right? Yep. Not like, not been to a lot of really big cities and, and known that. So like, you know, yes, like dealing with the traffic and dealing with just the population being so much bigger, it was a big, big shock for sure. Like I couldn't wait, you know, when I was a younger player, I couldn't wait to get back to Iowa, right? Yep. Like I was like, you know, I was just so foreign to me. Like I went to the facility, came home, didn't really go a lot of places, you know, just cause it was so, everything was just tougher. And yeah. out, you know, the fighting the traffic and fighting the the amount of people. So it was definitely uh, it was a transition phase, I will say, because like at the end of it though, we really it had become home for us too, yeah, because you right. know, we had spent half the year there. You know, we had, you know raised our kids out there. You know, um, you know had two kids out in Baltimore, and uh, and you know that place really became home for us. But the first you know three four years, it was definitely uh, it was tough. You know, just coming from you know a small yeah. town Iowa kid for sure. So were you? Were you married when you no, went out there? Were you nope, dating your wife? No, nope, I out? wasn't. Nope. We, uh, I was single my fr uh, my rookie year. I was going to say freshman year, my rookie yeah. year. Um, and then me and Shannon started dating uh, the off season after my after my uh, my rookie year. So it was okay. uh, two thousand eight. Uh, my uh, going into my second year. So yeah. yep. And it was uh, Mike Elgin that I played with at Iowa, a good friend of mine. Um, it was his cousin, so he set us up on a blind date. Oh, you know? nice. And we had actually met in college. And um, and uh, got to meet her and stuff like that, and had had a conversation with her, and, and just things never worked out then. But I didn't remember that uh, you know she was a farm girl from Iowa, yeah. a very nice girl, and um, and uh, and then just you know our past never crossed again. And then Mike Elgin says, "Hey, I got this cousin you need to meet," and I'm like, "Mike, I'm not meeting your cousin, okay? <laughs> All right? I'm not meeting your cousin, right?" Yeah. And uh, and obviously he's like, and then Mike's an engineer, works at John Deere, very calculated guy, and he's like, he's like Marshall. I can I've done you, the math I can, on this. I can see you spending the rest of your life with this girl. And I'm like, Mike, <laughs> chill out, okay? Right? Yeah. I'm more like the, you know, just, you know, don't yeah. let's not like get so serious so dang soon, right? Yeah. But uh, but it was great, right? Like um, you know, she's a amazing girl and we got three wonderful kids and uh and I'm super I'm super thankful for her because she's definitely been through a lot with me and all the injuries and taking care of me. And uh and yeah, she's a great woman. Yeah. So I mean, that kind of goes right into, we're kind of skipping ahead a little bit, but raising a family while you're in the NFL. I mean, do you have any advice for guys? I know that, you know, being an athlete's a whole different level, but for guys out there that got really demanding jobs, yep. how do you, how do you stay, just any advice you can give those fathers and husbands to do, try to do their best while yeah. focusing on their work too? Yeah, for sure. I would say like, what comes to my mind first is like, number one, like picking the right woman right that like you know even with like say like you're not married yet you don't have any kids yet picking the right woman that uh that is hard working that is um accountable that is like that when things go 
get tough, like she's like, she's going to like be a, a compliment to you. Right. So like picking the right woman that has the same values as you and understanding that like things are going to get tougher as we continue to grow. Like as our family grows and we start getting married and start having kids, things are going to be tougher. So if you don't have some of that stuff ironed out, just know that's going to magnify as you start having kids, as you start expanding, life gets harder as you get older with just decisions and choices and kids being, you know, kids like that can be really tough. So picking the right woman is, is very important. And then I would say after you have that and you guys start having kids, um, you know, a lot of it does, does definitely come natural. Cause like you can tell people, Oh, you know, your life's going to change when you have kids. And people told me the same thing, you know, and I, and, and obviously you hear so much things, but like, until that actually happens, you don't really have a right. clue, right. Until you actually have a, a child in your hands, that's yours. It's a very life changing experience. You know, it's like, you know, thing, you just think differently. Um, you know, the priority is your kids and your, your, uh, you have a responsibility to your kids, right. To raise them the right way to, to show them the way, right? And uh, and definitely football has helped me too that way also, you know, in my mind, how, I've, you know, how I'm wired, how I was, you know, how I was uh, instilled in me for sure. But um, it's, there's, um, I would say, you know, you, you lead with your heart, right? Like, and, and your kids uh, and just, you know, you lead by actions. You don't, you know, you don't, you don't show them or you don't just tell them you show them. Right. Like I'll, I'll say one example, like I used to chew tobacco, right? Like, and I did for like 10 years. Well, it was like it's 2012 and my son was born in 2010 and he's about two years old. And I'm like, how am I going to tell my son not to chew the tobacco when I got a can in my pocket and a lip in my, you know, and a, in a, and a chew in my lip, right? It ain't going to happen. Right. Like I want to set the example for him, right? So I quit then, you know, and I quit chewing in 2012 and I had to have, haven't had a dip since. It's because like, I want him to, you know, see, you know, that like, hey, I'm going to like preach who, you know, I'm not going to just preach and then not do it. Like yep. if I'm going to school you on this, walk I'm going to walk. Yep, exactly. I'm going to show you the way by my actions, not yep. just say, Hey, don't you chew. And then I walk around the corner and put one in. No, yep. I will show you that. Like I'm committed to this as well, this lifestyle and what we expect from you. So yep. that was, yeah. Well, talk about what's expected. I got a buddy of mine that is a welder up in the Dakotas and I, I did construction with him and he, uh, he has some, he always has a unique way of looking at things. But one of the sayings he has that he's always had is he expected a level when stuff had to get done, he expected everybody to be on board. He would always say when we were building stuff, somebody started complaining and he'd say, listen, Kings run with Kings. And if you ain't a King, you might as well get out of here. Well, you land at the Baltimore Ravens. Yep. And you've got Ray Lewis, Ed Reed, Suggs. Yep. What was that like? Yeah. Because in your in your line of work, arguably, there probably wasn't a better crew doing it than the crew that you walked into. No doubt. Yeah. No, oh, I mean, a bunch of Hall of Famers, right? I mean, just like guys that were like studs, right? Like we got our butts kicked on offense in practice. You want to know I was a good player, too. I got better as a player, too. We got our butts kicked in practice a bunch from our defense, right? Yep. You know, so, like, and just, like, so, like, learning from those guys and, and being around those guys was so cool to be around, like, pros like that, right? Like, like Ray Lewis, like, Ray didn't say more than, like, hi to me for, like, three years. You know what I mean? Like, he was a guy that, you know what, you had to earn his respect, and not by just, you know, talking to him. You had to earn it on the field. Like, if you were going to take uh, approach the game as at his level and sacrifice for the game and make it, make the commitments, like, and the sacrifices for it, like, you had to earn that. And that wasn't going to be a year-long deal. That was going to be, like, a two- to three-year deal, like, where, like, hey, if you're committed and, and you show us through your play and your dedication and your – that, like, okay, then I'll talk to you. But, like, as far as, like, now – you go work hard and, and then you earn your respect. And, and that's kind of the way it was, you know, like, and I, and I get that. Right. Cause like, you know, he was in the year, like year 10, or year 11, when I was a rookie, yeah. like how many rookie classes had he seen 10 of them come in? Yep. So there's, you know, there's seven guys drafted and there's 25, 20 guys that are undrafted. So there's, you know, just say 30 guys, 30 new uh, rookies coming in every year. Now only, you know, eight or, you know, seven or eight of them make the team or whatnot, but still at the every, even in June, there's 30 extra guys every yep. year. So like, there's just too many, right? Yep. Like I, I can't like, 
you know, shake hands with all you and meet all you and just like learn about all you know. You have to you have to earn your keep, right? He so he wasn't like, gonna expend the emotional capital no, to have exactly. a relationship that wasn't gonna be there. Exactly. Yeah, no doubt. So like there was a standard that was set there, right? And that was so cool because like I got to see the standard and then live up to the standard and then carry on the standard, right? I loved being able to do yep. that. Like, and just because like, that's such a great franchise where that has been built for the, like, since the start. And that continues to be carried on by guys because they draft people the right way. They bring in guys there the right way that also understand that. Right. And that there's a standard that's set. So like, it was so cool to see those guys, Ray, Ed, Sis, Haloti, you know, Jared Johnson was a, a big one. Uh, Todd Heap on the offense. Um, you know, Steve McNair was my quarterback my rookie year. Um, you know, just a ton of like. That's right. I yeah, forgot yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. A ton of guys that like, uh, that just showed you the way. And it was so cool to watch them because like, I like, I love to like, you know, if I'm going to try to be like, you know, if I'm going to like, this is who I want to be, I love to like focus on like everything, like yep. how they eat breakfast, what time do they show up? You know what I mean? How much film are they watching? You know, like all that stuff was so, so, uh, yeah. so cool to, uh, to watch them be pros. Right. And like our coaches always just said, Hey, you want to be, you want to be like him, watch him. Okay. We want you to be like him. Just watch what he does every minute of every day. Watch him yep. be a pro is what they said. Right. Cause he's a pro like 24 hours a day, seven days a week, not just on Sundays. Cause yep. like Ray even was like crazy amped motivational, like on, like on game day going nuts. You see him on TV and the cameras, right? Six days out of the week, he was very quiet, very calm, but like never late, never, you know, not showed up to a meeting on time, giving everything to football, you know, lifting weights hard, training hard, soaked in sweat all the time after a workout, like was a pro the whole time. So like it's neat to be around like guys like that, that, uh, that just paved the way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you have any, uh, any stories involving any of those guys that you can remember most memorable story of those guys? I would say my most memorable story. So like I got a good Ray Lewis story and I've told it before, but, uh, my rookie year, we were in practice, and I did not know there was a standard where in practice where Ray was in like year 10 or 11, and you didn't really want to necessarily hit Ray real hard in practice, right? Because like he's taking a lot of hits, and you're trying to – and I get it. I was the same way as I transitioned. I didn't know, right? I'm just doing my job. I'm going right. to do my job at a high level. I got this guy to block. I'll, I'll block him, right? Well, it was like a, like a, a tunnel screen pass where it was a pass that was out to the, um, out to the receiver. And then I had to block downfield. Well, so I had to block Ray on that play. And it was kind of a transition play where the play continued on out, out near the numbers. And so I had stayed locked up with Ray and then I kind of stayed in front of him. And then I probably, you know, stayed locked on and blocking him too long. And, uh, and he proceeded to just throw me to the ground, just like grab my jersey and just ragdoll me to the ground, just got just like <laughs> hip tossed to the ground. And like, so I'm getting up and I'm like, damn, he's pissed. I can just tell the way he threw me down. Normally they'll just like let you go, you know. Yeah. So he he threw me down and then I get up and he's kind of standing over me and you know, and he's looking at he's looking at me with a you know pissed. stern face, <laughs> mad. Don't you ever do that again. And like I didn't even like bat an eye, miss a beat. I said, Ray, no problem, no problem, never again. And like to that day, <laughs> like to, ever since that day, I never did hit him really hard again. Cause so so we go to so we go to meet our the film after that play. You know, we go in there, and my offensive line coach, is, he's kind of chuckling. He's like, Yeah, we probably should have told you. You know, you're, you're not really supposed to, you know, stay blocking Ray that long or hit him that hard. Okay, we don't really expect you to do that. You're really not supposed to do that. And, and then everybody's kind of laughing. I'm like, <laughs> that would have been yeah, nice. Thanks though. for thanks for letting me know. You know, don't yeah. tell me until after the fact. But of course, you know, they had to uh, get a few laughs out of that, right? You do you know? feel like that was kind of a test to say to see is he afraid of Ray Lewis or is he gonna just no, I think they're. I think they're excited that they knew I was aggressive yeah. and that like I'm gonna go block anybody. They're gonna like, oh, we're just gonna like you know let him let him let him throw get him a taste out of there, that. See what you know, see what happens. <laughs> yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. So yeah. yeah, that was uh that was a good, definitely a good story where uh where you got to know your role. Yeah, yep. know your role. 100%. And then as you guys being a being a veteran, you kind of yeah same sure. you deal. Take, you, you just take care take, of each other. Like yeah, yeah certain guys, and, you know, and that's just the way it is, right? Like after you've really gained a lot of respect and established, like you know. You still have to prove it, no doubt about it, but it's not there. It's also taking care of a player when, like, you know, if you're in year 10 
and above or whatever, just a number of years, it doesn't matter. Don't put a number on it, but like you've proven yourself, you've proven yourself that you're a physical hammer. You don't, we don't need you on a Wednesday, literally like just completely like, you know, cutting guys in half because we want you to save that for Sunday. Cause as you yeah. get to be an older player, you can't do that on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and then go do that on Sunday. As, a, as an older player, that comes down to one day a week where you can flip that switch and be that hammer. Yep. We need your hammer on Sunday. Like, you know, try to let, we're going to we'll work on technique the rest of the yeah, time. Yeah, correct. Yes. Yep. Yeah. So I, this is something that I, this was one of my favorite questions I thought up when I was making this outline. The Steelers oh. versus Ravens rivalry. Yes. One of the best rivalries in the last two decades, if not ever. Yep, for sure. I am a Cowboys fan. Okay. And I, I every time every time the Ravens and Steelers played, I tuned in because yep. that game, those games weren't just about the two quarterbacks playing. Joe Flacco, Lamar, Big Ben, obviously great talents. Yep. But those games, it always felt like defense, hard hits, fighting in the trenches, special teams made or break the game. For sure. And I just wanted to know. What is the mindset going into a Steelers matchup? Sometimes you guys play them twice a year. Sometimes yep. you guys play them three times a year. Yep, yep. Is that a more intense week than any other one? Well, no. I wouldn't say it's not because you got to take, like I said, I'm a preparation guy. You approach every single game the same. But just to set like the set the like the stage of that is like when you get drafted to Baltimore and you come in the building, one of your first meetings is you were drafted here. To beat Pittsburgh, okay? <laughs> yeah. We brought you here to beat Pittsburgh. Like, yep. you were drafted here to beat this team. Yeah. You know, and actually, like, thanks, Cincinnati kicked our butts during my time more than the Steelers. Yeah. But you were drafted here to beat Pittsburgh. Yeah. Um, and uh, and that set the tone, right? Right out the gate that, like, you know, we're, we're, we're here. We don't do anything unless they're in our division. we got to beat them twice a year. You know, all roads to, you know, to the playoffs and the seeding Goes is through. you got to win your division, right? So, like, and winning your division usually – meant beating Pittsburgh, right? Because they were dominant, right, with Big Ben. They were in their defense. My gosh, they were awesome. So, like, that sets the stage. And then, yes, like, Heinz Ward was, like, you know, just a uh, dang terror, right? And, like, and he would, like, you know, make some questionable, like, shots. Like, he took a big shot on Ed Reed one year, and really, like, that was never forgotten. So, like, guys were always headhunting for uh, Heinz Ward. And you had, like, you know, Joy Porter and James Harrison. Troy Palomalu. Troy Palomalu, <laughs> like, you know, guys that would just, like, level guys, right? Yeah. And, like, and, and do some extra, like, extra physical because it was a super intense game. And, like, and I always tell, like, Steelers fans – like, there's no better place to win in the NFL on the road than in Pittsburgh. Like, yep. best place ever. Terrible towels going, you know, 70,000 strong. And they play renegade in the fourth quarter when, like, they need a big play. And, like, it's an awesome place. And then when you win, it is the quietest place on <laughs> earth right at the end. We've won some game winners right at the end. And, like, literally, like, stadium. Silence the crowd. Zero right. silence. Just you know, clearing out, we're all celebrating, you know, we're leaving on the buses. Everybody's just flipping us the bird, you know, pounding <laughs> on the side of the bus. Like it's awesome. Um, but, uh, but that rivalry was built on those guys, right? Like yep. it's like really good defenses, Legends. right? Like you said, taking away, I mean, I was an offensive player, but like Steelers defense, Ravens defense, low scoring affair, all about turnovers and takeaways and special teams, hidden plays in, in the game, right? Mm -hmm. So, like, yeah, those are some, like, awesome rivalries. I mean, just, you know, playing up there underneath the lights. You know, we played a lot of Sunday night footballs up there. Yep. And then, you know, obviously them coming to us. Like, you know, it was, uh, it was a fun rivalry for sure. And just uh, a lot of hard hits and a lot of fights. Yeah. You know, some of our, like, worst, I remember, you know, and that was back before. So the fighting is not as much now because they find everybody now. Right. Like, where, like, once, like, they see the, like, the, the scrum of players, like, everybody gets fined. You know what I mean? So all of a sudden, you find 20 guys and you do that over the course of a couple of years. All of a sudden, the fighting is way out of it now, out of the, but back then, it was more accepted. You know, yeah. now it's not. So before, you could really get into some, 10 guy pileups were literally like, you know, it's just a big mosh pit for crying out loud, you yeah. know, and they mm -hmm. got to separate you and all that. But yeah. it was a good, uh, two really good similar teams built similarly, mm -hmm. right? To where, like, when you guys butt heads, it's going to be a really tough game because you guys are built the same way, yeah. you know, how they, how they view they want their team to be. So those were, those were fun memories. I also feel like their coach, how they approach head coach, Tomlin, yeah. been there, 
Harbaugh been there, Correct. which I think is the way to, I mean, outside yeah. looking in, I don't know shit. I wasn't in it, yeah. but yeah. I feel like sometimes teams don't give coaches near enough time to even build a foundation, but those two teams have stuck by their guy, no doubt. which is cool. Yep. I a hundred percent agree. Yep. This is also a question that yeah, is, <laughs> is one of my favorites. I was thinking about Super Bowl 47, your yep. Super Bowl you're going to yep. 2012, 2013. Uh, I was, it's my 13th birthday, February 3rd. That's my Young 13th bunch. birthday happened. Uh, I remember that Super Bowl <clears throat> because uh, there was an event that happened during that Super Bowl that kind of was odd. So you guys, they say the halftime at Super Bowls is way longer than any other halftime when you're playing the regular sure. season playoffs. Yep. But your guys' halftime was extra long. I mean, you got back on the field, but there was a blackout. Yep, for that sure. the whole stadium went dark. And you guys had to go back in the locker room. Yep. How the hell did you guys keep your composure? Because I know you were in that locker room for so long, then you come out, blackout, and then you got to go back in. So what were you guys trying to do to keep the momentum? Because you guys were kicking the shit out of the 49ers at the time, I remember. Yeah, it was basically. And then we returned. We were up pretty good. I can't remember how much we were up uh, at halftime, but then Jacoby – ran the kickoff back to start the third quarter, and we're like, oh, this is done deal. We're up, like, I want to say, like, 24. We're over, up by over 20 points, and it's like when you do that and put the knife in them at the start of the third quarter, it's like we're yeah. going to route them. Like, we're going to – this is going to be a blowout. Lights go out, and we're like, you know, and everybody's like, you know, what the heck, you know, and it like – but, uh, you know, Beyonce played – in the Super Bowl, or, you know, at halftime, and the walls were shaking inside the locker room. Like, it was <laughs> loud as loud could be, just, just, burr, burr, you know, so, like, you know, everybody's got their conspiracy theories or whatnot that they pulled them on, you know, on purpose, but mm-hmm. who knows. But uh, we couldn't go in the locker room because it was pitch dark in there, so we just stayed out on the field, right? So there was enough ambient light in there, uh, backup lighting, where we just stayed out on our, our own sidelines, and we're just stretching for, like, and, and waiting, right? Stretching and waiting, stretching and waiting, and uh, that's all we could do. And finally, you know, I can't remember how long it was. I think it was almost an hour, I think, at least. And, uh, man, the momentum had switched. My gosh. All we did was hang on to our asses for the rest of the entire game. We barely beat them. Yep. I mean, they just literally came on fire. They started scoring, and then we'd go three and on offense. they get the ball again, score. We'd go, you know, get off the field quick on offense. They'd score again. I mean, it was – and then this doubt creeps into your mind, like, are we going to blow this game mm-hmm. and literally, like, blow – a Super Bowl, like the worst way. Like I feel terrible for Falcons, Falcons, and uh, Patriots. Yeah, where you're up by over 20 points and you blow it, right? Yep. And then you know, and not to throw shade at Colin Kaepernick, but like if Tom Brady, we were playing Tom Brady in the in that game, we're losing. Yeah, right? we're <laughs> right. losing. Not not 49ers and Colin Kaepernick, but if it was. Yeah. Well, luckily we beat the Patriots earlier, but. If it's the Patriots in that setting, we're losing, just like the Falcons, right? Yeah. So very happy that we won. But like people are like, what do you think of that game? I'm like, I, that was the worst pins and needles game because the whole second half, then that puts pressure on you. Then you feel it's like, man, we need to score, we need to score. And then we go three and out. And it's like, man, we don't. And then they score again. It's like, man, we need to get this done. Then you put that more, much more pressure on it, and then things just start compounding, and it's tough to come yeah. out of that. But luckily they – they killed, we got enough to, to seal it at the end and get mm-hmm. it. Cause like, I'm so fortunate, like you said, get to be able to go to one and to win one. You'd like, cause you have this feeling, you know, when you get to go to the Super Bowl, it's like, man, but to actually win it too, so like, so amazing and so grateful because like tons of guys have been to them. Not a lot of guys have been to them, but at least some guys that get to go, then they don't get to win. It's, man, it's just, it's, I feel it's bad tough. for them. I wish, you know, I, I get it, both teams, you know, can't win but i feel bad for those guys that have maybe only made one you know and luckily yep. to even get to go to one mm-hmm. and lose it so yeah mm-hmm. it was a heck of a game for sure the other yeah. thing that people i think forget about that whole playoff run was that was ray lewis's last season no doubt yeah. was that a yeah. extra motivator for the team like we want to send ray out on the top of the mountain yeah for sure yeah i mean obviously you know you're playing, you know, at that level and you, you're playing, but it definitely meant something for sure. You know, at the start of the playoffs when he says, you know, and he'd miss a lot of time with his, with his injury. Yeah. Didn't too, he have you know, a triceps injury? Yeah. yeah. So it was tough. So to, but to try to send him out. Yeah. To, it was, uh, it meant a lot for sure. And, and who doesn't want to go out your last season, win a Super Bowl, and, and walk off in the sunset? That's what I wanted to do too, right? Like yeah. we were 14 and two and, and number one seed in the AFC. I'm like, man, we got a shot. At least we have a chance, you know, but like, I'm happy that he got to do that. I'm happy that we could uh, we could all share that memory for sure because it was yeah. definitely special. Yeah. yeah. 
Heck yeah. yeah. And you guys, that, that playoff run, I think people forget too, like you beat Peyton Manning, the Broncos, when they were stacked. Yeah. Stacked. Yes. Did you beat the Patriots that year t- in Tom the playoffs Brady too? too the Tom Brady. Yep. You got yeah. what? Well, I actually was rooting for the Ravens to win that yeah. playoff run because you yeah. guys were like the – I mean, you were Cinderella story on no the, going against the, some of the best in the game. Yeah, and we were a fifth or sixth seed, and, like, we got hot at the right time right during the playoffs, right? Because, like, before that, we had lost three of our four last games to end this regular season. So we were, we were one and three, and then, you know, and then we go on a, a huge run and beat, like you said, Peyton Manning. They had actually come to Baltimore – like week 14 and, be, and came to Baltimore, made the trip from Denver and beat us 31 to three or something like that, 34 to three in our stadium, like three weeks or four weeks before. So when we went out to Denver, we're like, not a lot of people gave us a lot of chance. And like, and even a lot of guys on our team, even like, you know, just, just spitball and saying, we ain't got a chance in hell. But that doesn't, you know, some guys that say that, that doesn't change the way they play, right? right. We're still go out. Yeah, go out and give it everything you got, but still you just didn't think that. And yeah, still, it's hard because you got that little voice in the back of your head. Saying, what yeah, if, what if, what and, if. And I still tell people this all the time because we do talk about it. It's like we play the Broncos that season, that year with that team. They beat us nine out of ten times. We play in ten games. They're beating us nine out of ten games. They're that good of a team. That Von Miller and Elvis Dumerville and Peyton Manning was on fire. Like they, I mean, Peyton Manning had like 49 touchdowns that mm-hmm. year. They were, they were electric, but – we got, you know, Showed up nine times day. out of 10, but that one time out of 10, you have a chance to beat them. Like if certain ways play out, we play good football, you do have a chance. And, and that's, that's why football is a great sport, which, mm-hmm. you know, it's, uh, it's the land of opportunity and, and you're only as good as your next performance. It don't matter what happened four weeks ago when you beat us 31 to three, yep. we'll prove it again. And you know what? We were better than the team. We were the better team that day. So. That's why, you know, people, professional sports, rolls over into so many aspects of life because of that just what yeah. you said right there it's about your next performance yeah and you know when i was selling my boss he he had a saying every every big sale i ever had he would he would you know i'd talk to him he'd call me whatever and then he would end the phone call with that's great what are you going to do for me tomorrow <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah, I know. Because he never wanted you to get too cocky. I know. And that's know. that's so true because sports, there is all the accolades, there is all the accomplishments, but then you got to do it again. Yeah. You got you got. It isn't a. It isn't a. That level of performance isn't a plateau. That once you get there, you're guaranteed to stay there. Yep. The works to, and that's a great analogy going back to you growing up on the farm because. Yep. Even when you get there, you have to get up every day. Yep. And you got to put in the work every day yep. or you are not going to stay there. Yep. No doubt. Yeah, How no doubt. hard was it yeah. to perform at that level? And because stay. obviously anybody seeing you today, you're not the same size person yeah, that no you doubt. were when you were playing. Yep. How hard was it to not only stay that physical, but stay that big? It was, yeah, extremely hard, extremely, you know, sacrifices were made all the time for football, right? Like family came first, but like football was a very close second. You know what I mean? Like I was very, and like, and the more success I had, the more determined I got to want to be great, right? Like I was one of the players where I, when I got success and I started like uh, doing really, really well, I became really like addicted to that process. And I'm like, man, look what this is giving me. And then like, and like being dominant on a football field, it's very like just addicting, right? Like yep. you want like, and, and when you're on that stage going against the best players in the world and all of a sudden you start saying, hey, I can play with these guys. Dang, this is awesome. And then you're like, hey, I'm not having some good games. And then it's like, hey, wow. At times I'm like dominating. Like I'm putting guys on their back. Like you're having some amazing plays. It's like addicting. So like <laughs> I started having that success and I'm like, man, this is amazing. I want to continue to do everything I can to try to stay at this level and, and not just be like playing in the NFL, but playing at a high level. So like I was addicted to being great. Like as I continued to play, like I got better as like, as my, like my career went on, right? Like I didn't make my first pro bowl till my fourth year. Right. You know, and then I went on a run from there on. So like, it wasn't like I was great right out of the gate. You know, I was on this path, right. And continue to, as a process, like my, like a lot of like really good players, like even their first year, 
they're really, really good. Well, I can tell you my first year was not really, really good. I was very not consistent player my first year by no means, you know, for my standards by no means. So that process, and then I also realized like when I retired from football, in my mind, like it finally, like it, the competitiveness left me, I didn't realize how often I thought about the game. And I can tell you, I thought about football every 10 minutes of every day for my entire <laughs> life of playing football from for sure NFL, college, you know, for sure probably it was probably started more in the NFL too. But like every 10 minutes I'm thinking about it, whether I'm eating the right food or whether I'm hydrating, whether if I was injured, big, big ones, which stunk was injuries where if you had an injury now, it's like, okay, I need to get back to 95% or 98% so I'm strong enough to block Dom can sue or JJ Watt, right? Like mm -hmm. I got these hammers coming and they're yeah. going to embarrass me if I am not as strong and if I am not the man I am, right? The guy I need to get back to. So all of a sudden there's this stress level in your mind, like I got to get my stuff back. So I'm going to get run over and pushed into the quarterback and he's going to tackle me and the quarterback, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So like I didn't realize when I retired that like that all left me was great. But man, my mental freedom was like, wow. I thought about the game all the time all yeah. the time but and 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 respectfully that's what it demanded mm -hmm. like if you wanted to be addicted to being great at anything in life it doesn't have to be football like you're you're driven obsession like, obsessed with it correct like football was like my passion right like and yeah. like even in the off season then i was like diving into eating the right foods and weight training and trying to get a little bit stronger a little bit faster and you know and just all the dynamics of that like it was always a 100 percent 365 year round just obsession for sure. And that's what, but for me to stay at that level and play at that level, that's what it took. Cause like you said, I mean, you're only as good as your next performance. Like I seen guys play five years and do really, really well. And then year six, they hit a rough patch and they get benched and they don't get benched after the game. They get benched at halftime. Yeah. Literally halftime. They say, Hey, that's enough for you for the day. We're going to let somebody else try. And they literally lose their job at halftime after five years of getting it done. And, it, and not even, they don't even make it to the end of the game. You get your job taken from you. Yeah. So it's like, that was always in the back of your mind too, that like, you got to perform every single next opportunity. It doesn't matter how many pro bowls or what you've done, yep. prove it again and again and again. And then you got a new, like, oh, here comes JJ Watt. You know what I mean? Oh, this guy's pretty good. Moving and, across and, the D line, no matter where you're at. Your button, and you're like, wow, that guy's good. And then it's like, oh boy, here comes Aaron Donald. They say this guy's going to be pretty good. And then it's like, wow, that guy's really good. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Like all of a sudden you're yeah. like, these guys are, you know, they're legit, you know, yeah. and then you got to, or, you know, prepare for new guys, new hammers. And it's like, man, it's a, it's a, it's the real deal. Yeah. Hey, this is a little off the subject, but I wanted yeah. you, you brought up Sue. Yeah. Yeah. So, I don't know if it's been, it's probably been four years ago now. We, company I worked for, we ended up taking a trip to Nashville. The Titans were playing Miami. Yep. And Sue was playing for Miami. Miami, yep. And it's a whole different experience going to a football game when you're actually there and you're down close to sidelines versus yep. watching on TV because you yeah. see so many little things. Yeah. And I have to say, that guy, he literally, when he wasn't on the field, he would be on the sideline, and wherever wherever the ball was, he would be there on the sideline just trash-talking, and he would follow the gameplay. I watched him, and he would follow the gameplay <laughs> down the field oh, yeah. just screaming at those guys, just yep. trash-talking like crazy. He yep. is an intense individual. <laughs> he is, yes, and I sure. know you know, you never see that on TV. Yeah, they, you're not going to see that <laughs> angle with the camera. It know. was hilarious, but yeah. anyway. No doubt. No, yeah, he's a... He's a, he's a, and he's a physical specimen too. You walk oh, up next yeah. to that guy and you're like, you better pack a lunch. You better <laughs> eat your Wheaties that morning because it's going to be a battle now for yeah. sure. You better get your mind right. Yeah. Is, the, is most of the yeah. shit talking happened in the trenches, do you think? Or it really, no, it really depends. I would say it really depends on the guy because yeah. like it doesn't, doesn't, uh, matter about the position because like you can have a trash talking corner quarterback like you see philip rivers like yeah. trash talking dbs i mean it doesn't yeah. like you know like so like it you know it could be linebacker offense it really depends on the guy because like a lot of times those guys and i did a little bit not much i would say i transitioned to where like 
it was made me like not play as consistent, but a lot of guys that helps them play better. You know I mean, gets them like elevated, like it's mentally, part of their like mental, mental. Yeah. gets them elevated to play at a, like another level, like a notch up for sure. So, yeah, so they're doing that to, to, um, to keep them sharp for sure, or to keep them on edge, I would say it, would, it keeps them edgy. And when they, and then certain guys, when they're edgy, they play better, mm-hmm. you know? So it, it's a, it's a, it's an edge, you know? Oh yeah. What yeah. offensive scheme was more fun to play, Flacco or Lamar? And I know you had yeah. success with both. Yeah, but. no, I mean, because yeah, because I mean, you know, it's it's been you know, Flacco's my guy, right? Like Super Bowl MVP, like my dog, like you know, blocked for him for over ten years, right? Like so, I mean, I like he's my guy, and then obviously like football happens, and 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 injuries happen, and just franchises, you know, it's their decision, right? And we go with Lamar. At the point in time with Flacco and Joe and at the end, the offenses that we were running were not good for Joe or us. We were throwing the ball way too much. We were averaging like 50 passing attempts a game. And that was just not us. That was not Joe. So when we were throwing the ball more, nobody likes that. You know what I mean? Unless you're like a, a you know. The wide Peyton, receiver Peyton getting Manning the ball. Or Tom Brady. that just, or Drew Brees where they live on 50 attempts a game. That wasn't Joe. That wasn't us. Well, somehow we got to that. And, I mean, we could talk for five hours on that, and I could get fired up and pissed about it. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> we are throwing the ball too much at the end. It was a breath of fresh air to finally commit to the run again. We had went like three or four years with not committing to it. People want to talk about it, and we had coaches that talk about it. But when the stuff hits the fan, let's see if we're going to commit to the run or we're just going to dive out of it and go to the pass and throw the ball 50 times a game. Well, it was a breath of fresh air to have Lamar where we were committed no matter what. We, even if it's the fourth quarter and we're down by 10 points, we're staying committed to the running game. So that commitment level had been gone for so long, it was a breath of fresh air. And then obviously, like, amazing that, like, we could run the ball that effective. We had some a really good offensive line. And man, we were hammering. I mean, we were yeah. we, we set the. I mean, it was with Lamar too, right? Like it doesn't go without him. He's the engine of. He's a running back as well. Yeah. Where he led, he was top ten in the that year as a running back as well. But like we broke the all time rushing record in the history of the NFL for rushing yards in a season. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now that's not you know Lamar, no doubt. I'm not saying anything that it starts with Lamar, no doubt about it. But we were a really good offensive line, and yeah. we had some fun. Yeah, like as a as an offense, yeah. we literally the D line did not want to play us because they're like oh, exhausted. We don't get to run the rush the passer today. No, we got to defend the run, and yeah. you got to defend the run for four quarters. And we got to literally like dominate people. Yeah, you know? so that was fun. Yeah, yeah. Like, that was fun. It's yeah. got to be a lot more fun when you're pushing. You're so like on the off whole, your offense. So, so like so when you're like one of the best things as an offensive lineman is when you're pushing a guy against his will. And he can't stop it against yeah. his will. He's fighting like crazy, gritting his teeth, and you're pushing him against his will and opening up the lane. It's like one of the best feelings ever. It's just <laughs> like as a lineman, like it's domination. It yeah, is. Right. Like it's like that's what we do. And then being able to do it and have the opportunity to do it as as much and as frequent as we did, that was fun. That's yeah. why, like I said, we were 14 and two and we just won so many games, and like we won in Seattle, where like uh, the Ravens, we'd never won it as a franchise in Seattle in like 26 or 28 years or whatever. We won in Seattle, you know. It's like that was the, you know, it was a fourth down play, and Lamar comes off the field, and they're like, "You want to go for it?" And I'm like, "Yeah, uh, let's go." That was you know awesome. What I mean, Lamar's like, and Joe, John's like, "You, you want to go for it?" And Lamar's like, "Yeah," and we go back out there. And it's like a fourth and four, and we get it, and then <laughs> yeah. we score a touchdown, and like that's yeah. what like turns the game. And we win the game. That was awesome. Yeah, like it's fun, stuff like that where you don't forget uh that it was uh just so much fun running the football yeah I, way better than pass blocking that's the hardest thing to do as an yeah. offensive lineman in the nfl is pass blocking yeah yep. yeah that's where like you got to hold back adamic and sue or jj watt or aaron donald it's tough sledding yeah and he won the mvp that year didn't he lamar yeah he yeah did yeah. That year. yeah that he was did. that's yep. cool yep. i heard that he got your rolex yeah, yeah, that's yeah, he pretty. Did, he did. That's pretty sweet. Got all the offense linemen Rolex. He did. He did. Yep. yep he did. That's sweet. I'm not, like I wear my, you know, I got a like a, a fitness watch, but like yeah. for me to wear a Rolex, I'd. Uh, it's got a it. sweet. It's a sweet. Um, it's definitely a, a neat conversation piece, and and uh, it's a good. Uh, and he's a good dude too. He takes yeah. care of his linemen. Yeah. Joe did too. So yeah. 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 Don't wear that when you're driving the green card. No doubt. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. You 
you you touched on that a little bit because when you got to Baltimore, you were you were in the you were within a group of guys and they were the leadership of that team. Yep. And then you wake up one day, fast forward, and you're the leadership of that team. Yep, for sure. How how was that like is that something that you you feel that creep on you or do you show up at camp one season and you realize that that torch has been passed and now then it's on me and is that a is that a is that a heavier burden to carry or is it a is it a privilege that it it's worth it it's worth it to you it's gradual for sure right like those opportunities uh they don't just come like you know on and off in a light switch right yeah. it's like it's a it's an accumulation of all those good choices and uh and hard work and 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 and, and playing well right like you yeah. got like if you're going to be the guy uh that's counted on you got to you got to be consistent right yeah. like they talk about being a consistent player well you know a guy can have you know two good games you know in a stretch but like no be consistent for all 16 okay have a few tough games where but still even in those tough games find a way to minimize the damage and and be a consistent player the entire season that that your entire body of work you can be counted on relied on also you know to fight through everything so that's a a day-to-day process year-to-year process and then all of a sudden you're right like you look back and you're like, man, I'm in year, you know, whatever, seven or eight. And it's like, wow, like I'm one of the old guys on the team. That that happens real fast. Cause like the NFL is so short lived. They tell you every day, you know, the NFL stands for not for long. And, and it's, they're so right too. Right. Cause like you see so many guys where they're here today, gone tomorrow or a bad injury and they're gone. You know what I mean? And, 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 uh, and it can be taken away so quickly that like, man, it's like, wow, I'm in the heat of battle, but I'm in year seven or eight or whatever year you want to say. And you're one of the older guys on the team. But like I said, I never forgot watching those pros, the older dogs, the vets, how they did it. And I'm like, I want to continue this. And I understand that like, it's not a lot of times it's not easy because sometimes it's also like, sometimes you got to stand up to the head coach. You're the old guy on the team. And if sometimes something needs to be said, you got to go tell him, you know what I mean? All the young guys are like, Hey, I'm in my first contract. I'm, I'm a young guy. I, I, can, be shipped this out. Up. I can be shipped out of here tomorrow. Okay. I can't take the risk. I can't stick my neck out, you know? And it's like, okay, you got to be the one that says, hey, you got to talk to the head coach on a tough topic and there might be a fight and there might be a little argument. And that's part of the deal, right? You're, that's, that's your job as an older player. So it was, it's, uh, it's tough, but I also got the opportunity to you know, stay with the Ravens and I felt like that was my duty, right? Like that was my task. That was my job as um, those guys had to do it. And I seen them do it where things weren't easy and they had to. And then I also seen like some guys too, that were also cowards when it came time to do it, they didn't do it. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? So I'd seen both sides of it. Like yep. it takes courage to be able to do that stuff, but you know what, this is what's expected of you, you know, and this is what you've seen. So continue it and respect it and also understand that they had to do it too. And this is a yep. hard thing, you know what? But I mean, life's about doing tough things all the time that you don't want to do. Like yep. this is just, it's another thing, but just buck up and do it, you know? Yeah. So, that kind of ties into a question. How great of a coach was John Harbaugh? Do you, you, you know, you got a lot of respect for Coach Doyle, Coach Ferentz, but I yeah. feel like John Harbaugh is kind of an underrated coach. That not a lot. Of, yeah. He doesn't get a lot of public yeah. publicity, and I feel like he's been doing it because you guys were win. I mean, you had a winning culture. You guys made it to the playoffs consi- consistently. Yeah, won a sure. Super Bowl. Like, yeah. how great of coach is John Harbaugh? Yeah, he's been our like he's been our 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 just rock right like he's been there the entire time right he's been there for i mean he's like the whatever second longest or long you know he's been there forever and he's a coach right he lives and breathes football right he's always constantly thinking about you know what he can do to make be a better coach be you know help us be us put us in better positions you know coaching staff making changes so like consistency of a head coach is so critical right like i thank john because like I didn't have to have a new head coach in year three. You're, I mean, just like like you said mm-hmm. now, like you could have a new head coach every year now with yeah. a new new offensive coordinator. Where all of a sudden, when a new head coach comes in, usually it's always because it's a bad team, right? You've had a bad record, so usually, and then always number one, number two, it talks about changing the culture. So like when a new head coach comes in, oh, we're gonna have to find out who really wants to be here. So then they basically what that means is like they really gotta bust them in practice and really like. Uh, performance data and like and really like 
basically try to make you reprove yourself, reestablish yeah. yourself. The slate, slate's wiped entirely clean. Like, we, you know, you have to reestablish uh, your trust with the coach, right? That trust gets built up over years. Like, John could trust me, right? I could trust John. Well, if John's gone in year five and I got to reestablish trust with this coach, I got it like that makes it tougher. And then a new offensive coordinator and certain guys can really struggle with that. So like him being able to be there and and have that you know consistency was was critical to to my success, right? Like I wouldn't be the same guy if I didn't have the same head coach for that long. It makes it hard as a player, like, you know, to have a new to change that all the time. And then sometimes opportunities are different with certain people. So so I'm very thankful. Like, like I said, he's a football coach. You know, his dad was a coach. His brother's a coach. Yeah. That family lives and breathes football, yeah. right? Like they grew up in football their entire life. It's all they know. You know what I mean? So he's a, he's a good man. He's a, I respect him. You know, we, uh, we had our, our squabbles and our fights once in a while, you know, because like I said, you know, I felt like I had to stand up for the team and, and those were some tough conversations, but like I respect John and, and, uh, and uh, you know, appreciate him as a coach. You were talking about some of the players you went against. Watt, Miller, Donald, Geno Atkins, Cameron yep. Hayward. Yep, Cam, yep. Uh, I know that all those guys were tough, but was there any guy out there that had a specific move that you were just like, holy shit, am I going to be able to, like, is that, there was a move that was just like, damn, am I ever going to be able to stop this? Certain, every guy had a little bit different, yes, for sure, of their, like, trademark moves, but, like, like Aaron Donald is very like what what he has is he has like three really good ones. Normally like a really good player has one really good one and then they'll have a counter to keep you honest and then they'll go back to their number one move to beat you, right? Like if you if the counter move, right? But usually it's one really good move. Like and and still that can be a very that can be a Hall of Fame player that has one dynamic really good move, right? But like at the extreme Aaron Donald has three, right? He has all three. He has the inside, the outside and the bull, right? So that's a dynamic feature where you can't account for all three, right? Okay, if I'm going to stop the inside move, then he's going to bull you into the quarterback. You know, he did 52 reps at 225. You want to talk about strength, he'll throw you into the next county, you know, right? <laughs> so, like, you know, and then he ran like a 4640. So he has like NASCAR speed Take with outside. like bull strength. So, like, so he's like the extreme, right? That, like, that I'm happy he wasn't in our division. I have to play him twice a year. But uh, Geno Atkins was a guy I talk about all the Underrated. time. Underrated. Yeah, tremendous respect. His bull rush was one of the best bull rushes ever. Like, he was only six foot tall. He had calves that were, like, the size of, like, coffee cans. <laughs> and, like, you want to talk about a guy that could bull rush? You would not yeah. stop him. Like, and it's a bad feeling. I remember, like, talk about pushing a guy against his will. I never stopped him on a bull rush. I slowed him down as much as I could. But at the end of the pass, he was still – I was losing ground with him. It's a terrible feeling to have. So to know that you could never stop this guy. Like if he had five seconds to get there, he's going to push you into that. You know what I mean? Like say if I, you know, I'm at that trash barrel yep. and he has five seconds, I am going into that trash barrel 100% of the time. That's a <laughs> shitty feeling, right? But to be able to slow that down – and, and, and die a slow death is what they call it on the offensive line, especially with a bull rush. you got to build it to slowly die. You can't die quickly. Give him just enough time to get it out. So, like, Gino was that guy that had that bull rush that was just like I hated, right? Like I hated going against him, you know, and uh, respected the heck out of him. Um, and like I said, you know, when he's in your division, you play him twice a year, he ain't going anywhere. He's in your back door. Good, <laughs> get used to it. You know, yeah. you're playing him for eight years or whatever. I played him for 10 years. Like, he ain't going anywhere, neither are you. So just get ready. It's yeah. coming, you know. Yeah. So that was that aspect. Um, J.J. Watt had another uh, – he was on another level, too. I would say he had two really good moves. Really big arm over. People call it a swim move. That was huge, right? Like, his swim move was just – dynamic as heck right like that it was uh, just so tall and, and big and then his bull rush he was very strong too not a, not probably as strong as Geno's but still really really strong so like JJ had two uh two moves um Dom Kinsu is a big bull rush guy too he's very strong too very very strong bull rush um but you know like I said guys that just had the strength was always the the what you didn't like as a as a player where like they had that bull rush where you couldn't stop it. Cause like I prided myself in being, I could stop a lot of guys where literally at the end of the play, I could physically stop you. You're not getting around me no matter what. There's just few guys that could not, I could not stop. And that, 
That's a that's a shitty feeling for sure. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because it goes both ways, right? Like I right. said, you're in the run game pushing a guy against his will. Love it. You're yep. in the facing a guy that's uh, that that you can't stop. It's uh, it's tough. Yeah. And the, I I watched you know JJ recently retired and he retired this year and yep. people talked about that guy could play every position on the D line. At one sure. point in his career, he did. He played everywhere. So he just picked out who is the worst person on this line, and just, I'm going there. I was just, yeah, yeah, for sure. I was just going to tell you, I was like, yeah, and you know how where he went, where he lined up? He lined up a lot of times on the weakest link. Yeah. He would watch, you know, six games of your film and find out, you yep. know, which guy he he was like, hey, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go do my thing yep. here. Yeah. You didn't like if he's lining up you on all, all game. It's for a reason. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So that's you know when you feel it. If yeah, you're that poor sure. guy. For sure. Yeah. And I that's mean, what that yeah. was what makes it so hard when you are a rookie and you're starting. A lot of times you get your start because somebody's injured. Yep. And then if you have the bad luck that you're starting because somebody's injured and you're playing a team with somebody like JJ Watt, you know you're gonna see the best one of the best players you're ever gonna play against. He's all coming day for you all day. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I mean, it's 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 dog eat dog out there for sure. Yeah. And they're gonna try. And I mean, it's all about matchups and opportunities. And it's like, yeah, they're gonna they're gonna they're gonna. That's where he's gonna make the most impact. Exploitation. Yeah. yeah. For sure. Best guard. Do you? What are some of the best guards you think are in the game right now that you look at and are like, damn, they're holding it down. <clears throat> they're future Hall of Famers. They've Zach Martin comes to mind for sure for the Cowboys. Like Zach came in. And like watching his game film as a rookie was amazing. He would lock it down, like just amazing. Like he was first team all pro, made the Pro Bowl his rookie year. And that was for a reason. He's a really, really like uh, generational player for an offensive lineman. So like I got a ton of respect for Zach just because of what, like just the standard that he set even as a rookie, like how skilled he was as a young player. I'm like, Dang, he's a, like such a like a really good player at a young age. You know what I mean? Like coming right out the gate, he was he's very very consistent. Like uh, in pass pro and in the run game. So uh, Zach Martin definitely. Um, gosh, and not like now that I've been out, you know, three years. I'm trying to think of uh, older guards that were still playing. It changes so fast. Uh huh. Like I think like Jason Kelsey for the for the for the Eagles. He's yep. a center, but I mean I, I I got a lot of respect for him. He's a he's an undersized, smaller player, but gets it done at a high level. You know, knows his body. Um, you talked too much to Linderbaum. Yeah, I did. Yep, yep. I've gotten to know him just a little bit. Yeah, yeah just because uh, the, uh, the you know the Ravens connection and uh, you know they did a little media thing with me and him too and stuff like that. So, uh, but yeah, he's a uh, you know. Iowa kid, humble yep. guy, grew up in Solon, you know, just yep. right down the road. Um, I remember yeah. playing him Got in high school. pretty hard by Solon. And uh, so he was died, unstoppable. So in high school. Yep. 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 He yep. was unstoppable yeah, <laughs> back in the uh, day. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he's got some, you know, he's got some skills to him where he just moves really well for such a big guy, right? Yep. And humble, hardworking kid. You know, I'm, I'm happy that, like, he had a really good first year too, right? Mm -hmm. Didn't get injured, started every game, was consistent, and, like, for him, like, he had a really good rookie year, which I'm happy for him. Because, like, it's it's tough getting established when you're a younger player. Like, the, the skill level is usually the toughest thing, right? Playing against guys, you're like, man, every guy that I play is first team all big or, uh, you know, the, the best in the conference, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, happy for the kid for sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So as you're playing – as you're playing, everybody that's in the NFL has an idea. You've got this plan in the back of your head because yep. you never know when when it's going to end. But yep. you got this idea of what, oh, I'm going to do, you know, this is what it's going to be like. Yep. But at the same time, when you're that competitive and you love the game that much, yep. it's like knowing when – to get off that, <laughs> to yep. get off that tilt a whirl. Yep, for sure. So, what brought, like, what was the decision process that brought you to, okay, yep. it's now's time? Yep. Uh, just my injuries, like, like listening to my body, right? That was, uh, was my, my way. Um, 2000, so I retired in 2019. Yep. So, two years prior to that, 2017 season, I, um, I played, uh, well, sorry, let's go to 2016 season. I tore uh, my left shoulder, um, rotator cuff in my left shoulder. So I missed like four games, 2016 season. 
moved to left guard from right guard and finished the season at left guard, played my whole, my whole, most of my career on the right side, never played left at all, played right tackle in college, played a little bit of left tackle in college, but making the position switch, waiting to get surgery till after the season, you know, finished the season playing left guard, did, you know, well, made it happen, was just stressful though. Like everything was just different, like muscle memory, everything yeah. in my left-handed stance was like terrible. Just consider like wiping your ass with your right hand <laughs> yep. and wiping your ass with your left hand. Yep. Just do that. Go ahead and do that for an analogy for the yep. non-football player. And that's exactly the feeling. Every yep. muscle memory and all your footwork and everything is just off. off. So dealing with that was tough. Getting through it, getting the surgery, rehabbing, coming back and being ready for the next season. I make it two games and break my ankle two games into that, that 2017 season. And it's a Weber, it's a Weber C fracture, a spiral fracture of my fibula. I'm done. They go into the locker room because normally I could try to fight through. I fought through a shoulder surgery the Super Bowl year two. And uh, they're like, no, you're done for the year. So I fought through so much stress and, and rehab to get back, made it two games, broke my ankle, done for the year, get surgery. I'm weightlifting. And in December, I tear my right shoulder bench pressing. And I have to get surgery God. in my right shoulder bench pressing after I'm already missing the entire season, I have to get another surgery. So then at this point, surgery on my left shoulder, break my ankle, surgery on my right shoulder. I'm like, okay, my body's telling me I'm, I'm, about, I'm about done, right? Yeah. And, and mentally, the only thing that was really wearing me down was the rehab. Yeah. So all the rehab from root, when you have an injury and gaining range of motion back and strengthening that, that, uh, that, you know, mobi- that uh, shoulder or knee or whatever joint you have, sh- strengthening that joint again to get back to play football is so hard. You're constantly on a time frame, right? Because you have to get back to play that fall. So I have, I'm on a time frame to get back as fast as I can, as strong as I can to play again. It wasn't like, oh, I got two years to just kind of chill and wait. No, you got Dominic and Sue coming waiting for you at the, at the fence. Okay. Get yep. your ass ready, you know? So it was that mentality and uh, to where my body was, I was doing so many rehabs. It was wearing me down mentally doing rehab. And I'm like, all right, after I ankle, shoulder, I was like, okay, I'm done with rehab. I was after this, I was mentally done with rehab. Now I'm going into 2018 season. I'm like, I'm retiring after in, in 2018, if I get another injury, like if I get another shoulder injury now, cause I was already, this was three shoulder surgeries for me. I did one in 12, one in 16, then one in uh, 17. So I'm like, okay, if I get any, anything, knees, Shoulders, ankles, I'm retiring in 2018 because I was like, I'm done with rehab, yeah. not rehabbing another injury. So I made it all 2018, completely healthy, had a good year health-wise, and had fun again. Like, got to play the whole year and not have to go through an injury. So, okay, I said, all right, I was great. I'm grateful. Now 2019 season comes. Now I'm like, I'm giving it thought. You know, this is months of thought, right? Not just like a – not just a – Uh, an armchair decision that like, okay, now I'm retiring no matter what after this year, no matter what happens. If I make it 100% healthy and we go, you know, undefeated and win the Super Bowl, we go 0-16, it does not matter. I'm retiring no matter what because like I just know that – You're cheating the clock. Correct. Yeah, like it's – I'm a compound interest guy and like things compound and I'm getting older. I'm 30, you know, I'm 35, 36 – you're playing the best in the world and they're in their twenties. And this is a, yep. it's a violent game, violent, you know? So it's like, I know that, you know, there's a lot of wear and tear in my body. So we go 14 and two and we lose to the Titans and it was hard on me. You know, we're like, Hey, we're, you know, really good team, but still everything is preparation, giving it thought. There's a plan. There's a process. You set goals, you write things down, you're prepared. I was prepared to retire and I did. So yep. I walked away when, and I, and I luckily, and I, like I said, it's about perspective, and I was grateful that I made it two years without being injured. So I made it my last two years, got to finish playing football at a high level, and starting every game is a priority to me. And like it's a, it's a show of accountability that, that, that you can count on me to be there, and I'll fight through some small stuff along the way for sure, but I'm going to try to start every game. So doing that, I'm like, I'm grateful for my time. Now walk away before you push it too hard. And also in my time, I'd never made it three seasons in a row without a major injury in the NFL ever. Uh, yeah. And I made it 17 and 18, or I'm sorry, I made it 18 and 19. And I go into 20, would have been year 14, and try to make it never done before in my life, try to make it being 36 and, and year older, 14, yep. try to make it another year injury free. Wasn't going to happen in my mind. Wasn't going to happen. Yeah, there was a chance it would have happened. But then also, like I said, I was super grateful 
to play 13. I'm like, wow, I've gotten to play 13 years. You with know, the same team. Yeah, with the same team. Got to win a Super Bowl. Got to play, you know, the level of style of play I wanted to play for a very long time. And it's like, now it's about my family. And I didn't want to get like, because, you know, people have neck injuries. People mm -hmm. have, I mean, look at DeMar Hamlin. Yeah. For crying mm -hmm. out loud. I didn't even, you know, that has been so far from us. But that stuff can happen, right? Yep. This is life. So it's like, you know, you know, it's a violent game where, I was not willing to get it, have another injury and then risk having to be a, a major injury where I just got, like I said, I'm yep. quitting when you're, while you're ahead is not, not quitting. Right. You know, I, yeah. I was very, very, very grateful. I, yeah. and then the cool thing about that was, you know, your last season was probably one of the most fun seasons you had. Cause you got to run the yeah, ball 40, exactly. 50 times a game, you know? Yeah. For one, three, for three hours when we lost to Tennessee, it was terrible. But for six months, we got Dominating. to have fun. Yeah. You know what I mean? We got to break the rushing record. We got to win in Seattle. We got to, you know, you know, get after it on Monday Night Football in the Coliseum in L.A. You know, we just kicked the snot out of the Rams and, like, yep. rushed for, like, I don't know, 200 and some yards. Like, and, like, so, yeah, all those memories for six months. And when you're winning like that, the whole building's bubbly. When everybody win, when we win, yep. everybody's happy. So you got to have fun for six months and also understand that, like, that's, that's – that's more important, you know, because yeah. like at the end of the day, it's, uh, you know, it's, it adds up for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. What has been the biggest adjustment since you retired? Do you miss that beard that you, you know, that oh, ginger know. beard there I you had? I miss the beard. I don't because, uh, you know, I was uh, a big guy for so long. Like I, I like the beard where, uh, you know, it was just a, it was a routine too. It's also like, you know, the old little giants intimidation factor. You know, yeah, I got yep. to see like the older, like back in the day, the Patriots all had one year, they all had beards like yep. Logan Mankins, Matt Light and uh, Connolly and Kaiser. They all had beards. So I was like, I want to be like those guys. That's cool. You know, they're all got their yep. burly beard. So I had my burly beard for a long time. It's just nice to have something different. You know, life's about variety and change. It's just nice yeah. to shave and, uh, and uh, feel my face a little bit. Um, and to like, it's nice being lighter too, right? Like I'm, 50, yeah. 60 pounds lighter. And I just feel so much better too. You know, well, you feel, you look so much like, I feel like I look better too. I'm like, I'm just not so big. Like when yeah. you're, when you're three bills and you know, one year I was 320, like there's nowhere to hide. You're sweating all the time. You're huge. You're, yep. you're, you're built to push people around. You're not really built to, you know, be in the heat, uh, yep. you know, clothes, clothes aren't supposed to fit, you know, yeah. this stuff is, you know, you're just a big human, you know? So it's, uh, it's nice that clothes fit and, uh, you just feel a lot better. So, I mean, that's, uh, that's been the advantages. Uh, the biggest, uh, biggest change. Yeah. is just, like I said, I thought about football all the time, like every, you know, every minute, every 10 minutes, I'm thinking about, you know, all the, everything that I can, you know, control and, and am I doing everything to the fullest? So it's nice that that left me, which was nice. Like yep. the, like, I don't have those guys to block anymore. You know what I mean? I thought about like, like we played Aaron Donald on Monday night football my last year, the schedule comes out and you're like, oh, yeah, we got Aaron Donald on Monday Night Football. I'm like, here we go. It's yeah. a big test. You know what I mean? And you can get embarrassed on Monday Night Football. So you think about that in the mm -hmm. back of your mind all year long. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah, we got him on Monday Night Football. You better be ready. So like that mentality and that mindset and that thinking, you don't have to prepare for those battles anymore. Right. Mm -hmm. Those uh, you're not blocking those guys anymore. So it's uh, so the, the nice thing was that that left me to where I don't have that uh, that competitive um you know, edge in the, in the back of my mind all the time. So, yeah, so that's been nice. Uh, and just focus on the family, right? Like I said, I, I, uh, we have, you know, everybody that, that are parents nowadays have tough, tough tasks of raising, yep. you know, kids in this, this environment now, right? Like with screen time and, and just the way the world is now that like, you know, my priority is like making sure our kids are raised right and that they, they have a good work ethic and that they're respectful and you know, no matter what they can do that they can talk and communicate to people whatever they want to do as long as they can talk still to people and not you yeah. know keep their head down and not look people in the eye and give a good handshake and just you know just be able to communicate so like raising our that's my like that's my focus right is our yeah. kids for the next you know 10 years or and plus like I want to make sure I do my job right as well as also you know our lifestyle and our environment in the NFL like you have to be careful, you know, like our kids are, are not raised the, you know, like normal kids. Right. So yeah. like I have a duty and so does my wife. Like we have a job to do on making sure that they're raised the right way and staying humble, right. Yeah. And staying grounded no matter what the condition. So that, and my biggest challenge would probably be, um, you know, just turning off that. So, like you said, sometimes I want to be over critical or over, um, 
like uh, setting my OCD almost on everything I want to do. I want to make yep. everything like routine and do the, like with football where like that can get a little, a uh, little rough on the wife at home, you know, right. like, where like, <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah. Shannon, she was, uh, she was happy to have me, you know, gone once in a while, you know, with football and, and, uh, and like, you know, cause like I said, I'm kind of a, kind of an anal guy, uh, you know, just set my ways to where, uh, I want everything done a certain way. That's tough all the time. Right. Yep. So, and then we're in the transition too, where me and Shannon and my wife were around each other all the time now too, you know, so yep. our, our, you know, our, um, our lifestyle has changed big time too. And everything's going really, really well. But like I said, we just fight some, uh, me having to just relax once in a while, take yeah. a deep breath, just chill. Okay. Yeah. You know, like, you know, you're not, you know, not in that environment anymore. And we're, uh, but yeah, so I'd say that'd be one of the one of the challenges. She torture you by taking you on trips and not giving you an itinerary ahead of time and saying, we're just going to wing it. <laughs> yeah. Well, she's, well, yeah. And like, well, and the thing is, yeah, she, uh, we, well, we can't though nowadays, right. You got to yeah. have, she got to have some schedule. Otherwise, like yeah. I, I will know we, uh, we know <laughs> I, we can't do that yet. I can't handle that. You know? <laughs> yeah, I've got to have some structure. Yeah. Yep. But she does a lot of the planning though, too, which is yep. good. So, I mean, I, I can't falter for that, but yeah, so it's, uh, it's been good. So you you enjoy you enjoy fishing a little bit, yep, and hunting a little yep. bit. Yeah, I love to fish. Which and hunt. which is your which what it, what is your what's your best hunting or fishing trip that you've taken? Yeah, and maybe what is your Dream. what's something you'd like to do on your bucket list in those yeah. those um, hobbies? Like so, I fished more than I hunted. Obviously, just because of football, you just didn't have time to hunt. You know, you're yep. you're busy from July to February with football every day. Um, so I fished more. Um, so I love to fish and I love to hunt too, but I've, I've just fished so much that that's, uh, that's just in my blood more at yep. this time. Now I'm really getting into hunting white tails and got to, yep. you know, shoot a really nice buck, uh, three falls ago on our property with a bow, which is great. So I love that as well. Like, um, so I would say, um, my favorite fishing, um, is, uh, so I, um, I take a trip. Usually I go to rainy river, up in northern Minnesota, and we fish like a spring walleye bite, yeah. and uh, and I like to go up there and jig fish for walleyes. I I grew up fishing in a river, you know, the Wapsi, Wapsi oh, yeah. Pennican River in Anamosa. Mom would drop me off at the dam, and I would cast jigs with a couple of friends. You know, town kids ride their bikes down. I'd spend all day. She'd pack me a lunch, and I'd fish. So, like, I love to fish. Um, fishing a jig in a river, walleye fishing. Yeah. That's where I love. I like to bass fish too. I love smallmouth fishing. Um, but yeah, that, and then I've also gotten into, I did a ton of ice fishing, you know, we would ice fish after the season. Um, we would go fishing up at Lake Winnipeg a ton. Yeah. We used to do that a, a bunch, you know, before the kids got real, real busy. And, uh, so that, um, what else, um, what I'm looking forward to, what I do look forward to, I, I like to go tuna fishing in Mexico. Oh, so I got yeah. into uh, yellowfin tuna fishing in Mexico and I absolutely love that. Like that's, uh, that's fun where I, I have a good buddy that has a condo down there with his wife and um and i stay down there and fish with him and me and him fish together and uh and we get to go after those tunas which like if if you've ever been in the saltwater saltwater fish are just like different on, level on, yeah like they're just they're just workhorses power horses right yeah. like any anything Strong. you catch they eat pound for pound they just fight like crazy so i love to do that i went down this winter and had a, we had a really good trip and i usually bring back some tuna uh tuna steaks kind of like so a d lineman yes tuna. <laughs> yes exactly yes yes just built for make sure. you earn it yeah uh and then i'm actually um uh, one of my old teammates i'm going on a first uh like hunting outside of Iowa. I'm going on a caribou hunt in alaska this oh, fall that would be yeah awesome. yeah so i'm that going to like awesome. uh i heard that they all migrate together and they come in at one they come in at one time and if you miss it yep gone they're you're yeah, never I've gonna heard, see another yeah, one i've heard they're they're very nomadic yeah like yeah. you like here today gone tomorrow we're like when they're here they're like oh you got a thousand to pick from no big deal like this is easy but then like they and they then next day they're gone 10, they're 10 15 miles like the other you know yeah. The, yeah so it's yeah so we're gonna we're gonna chase that dynamic but like i'm excited to just see alaska a little bit yeah. and, uh, and go on that hunt with jared so uh so i'm doing that so i'm looking forward to that yeah you loved alaska yeah we i've never been very far inland we took a cruise up there uh with a deal my wife does and i really wasn't you know like i'm one of these people the older I get, the less I like being cold. So I'm like, yep. I like going somewhere warm. Yep. But I wanted to go. I was all about going. But I have to say, it's one of those places that to take a camera, you could just throw the camera away. Yep. Because no picture you're going to take in Alaska 
when you show it to somebody and they go, oh yeah, that's neat. It does not do it justice. Yep. Just the grandeur of everything and the size of everything. Yep. And it's just, yeah, I'd go back tomorrow. Yep. Um, yep. And we, we are going to go back, but yeah, you'll love it. It's, yeah. it's amazing. Yeah. Just don't feed the bears. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt, for sure. So, Heck yeah. So, uh, what's a, what what's ahead of you besides these awesome hunting trips and besides Canton, Ohio? What I mean, do you, is there you feel? I feel like you're this guy that's been you. You're playing at this high level, and you're disciplined, and you're kind of addict. You were kind of addicted to that discipline. Yeah. Is there some industry you want to go in that you can maybe try to find that? try to be the best at it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Cause you I know. Yep. Well, and I, and I, yeah, I think about that too, you know, and it's, uh, and the tough thing is right. Like right now I think about, you know, what do I really like to do? And I, and I do love like the outdoors. Like I do love like the hunting and fishing and, and I'm also like, just like being outdoors, right. In general. Right. Like I just, I'm a, I'm a guy that like, likes to be just doing things outdoors, working with my hands, fixing things. Like I, I definitely enjoy that process. Um, and also like, I really enjoy farming. You know, I do like, I'm, you know, spending time with my dad and spending time on the, the farm that, uh, that I was raised on. Yeah. And like, and as I get older, that just kind of, you know, that means more to me, right. That like the, like sacri the sacrifices and the generations, not just my dad, but like my grandpa and yeah. my, 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 my great grandpa, my, my dad's, uh, my dad's grandpa, you know, just like the, the amount of hard the work, that they, the, the amount of hard work that they put in, to sacrifice for the, for the farm and for, for their family. You know, that's, uh, that's something that I think about more that I'm grateful for. I'm, you know, I'm not just grateful for my dad, but I'm grateful for that entire generations of, yeah. of family that, that worked extremely hard. Think about how hard those generations were. Like, like I consider like, I got it easy now compared to yeah. what two generations ago was, you know, going through the depression or through a world war, yeah. like, you know, fighting in a war, right? Like the adversity that people went through back then, to get where we are today, like there was a ton of like hard work and sacrifice that like I'm very grateful for, right? That the opportunities that I have as a kid, you know, like having a meal on the table every single day, right? Like when mm -hmm. I played football, you know, and guys uh, in the NFL, some guys grew up homeless, yeah. you know, grew up like trying to find a meal every single day. And you're not, you're not exposed to that in Iowa, right? Like as far as like me seeing that in a, in a small town, but like hearing about that and people actually willing to talk about that, that makes you appreciate the, like, well, yeah, I never had to worry about a meal on my, on, on my table. Like I always had supper. I always had yep. breakfast. I always had like, and the farm provided that for us, for our family and the people that worked the farm and sacrificed the time that was provide, that was, you know, that was sacrificed, you know, for us. Right. And like I said, like, I think about that more now than, than I ever have. Yeah. So that's definitely farming's in, in my, uh, in my blood and, and the outdoors is in my blood. Um, and, and probably those two for right now, some, uh, some dynamic of that and figuring that out. Um, but like I said, right now, I also know that like my priority right now is my kids. Yep, you yep. know what I mean? And luckily I'm also feel fortunate that like I can give them yeah. my hundred percent attention, right? Like when we go to ball games, we're all in, like when we, like when we, uh, do stuff together, like we're, we're hundred percent participants, you know, we're going to be at every ball game, every event. And I feel like I said, again, I feel grateful that we don't yeah. have to miss that stuff. Yeah. You know? You're able so to do that. Raise the kids. And then, you know, you never know, like too, like I love football too. So, I mean, Coach. I don't know if that will ever be in my, I don't know, but I just do know that I can't start football because that's too much time away from my kids. Like sure. the, the time that you give up yep. as a coach is a lot. So right. I definitely know that I won't, can't even scratch that itch until, um, you're until a little the further kids, down yeah, the, the road. kids possibly go to college. But, yep. but yeah, but like I said, so those are kind of, you know, farming outdoors, possibly football. Those are probably, those are, those you are got options. options. Yeah. That's the most important yeah. part. Yep. So that's so, good. Yeah. Well, I think we're going to wrap it up here, yeah. but there's one final question I got to ask. Oh, geez. What equipment do, do the Yondas run? Case or deer? We are red. Okay. <laughs> okay. There you go. You just pissed off half the audience. Yeah. Half the, the audience. Other half is like, Good I thing knew we're that at the guy end. was smart. Nope. I knew he was nope. smart. Nope. I know. I got uh, I got a, a little food food plot tractor and uh, 
and it's a case little 75 uh 75 a farmal and like and i was contemplating yeah. getting like a at one point there was like a good deal on a john deere and the and the my dad and my uncle and my cut they're like no no you, don't no, want it. No. you can't buy green now they did have a, a green corn head at one time you know what i mean Where, only like, because it was a good deal they couldn't pass there you it go out. exactly right <laughs> i they're know still, that story they're still conservative but yeah. like we've always had uh at least in my time, a uh, case combine. Yeah. Um, I want to say they did way back in the day have a New Holland for one year. Yeah. But the the famous story with that was though you never took your gloves off or your coat when you were in it because <laughs> you were going to be out working on it, so you didn't even take your gloves off. <laughs> we uh, grew up. With my them. uncle said that. Thought that was funny. But but yeah. So yeah. Uh, they plant. They just got a, a plant and tractor. Yeah. We're case. Yeah. yeah case. There you go. Yeah. I heard the awesome. case tractors better combines deer. That's what people said. I don't know. I've heard that too. I've heard I, that more. I've heard that more too. They said yeah, the case. tractors. You got to go case. Look at that combine. To be the great. Yeah, uniter. I'm trying to. I'm trying to get the people back on here. Yeah, yeah, get everybody involved. So yeah. okay, good yeah. for you. Well, we really appreciate you coming on yeah. and telling your story. It's it's amazing. And I told I told Jason Egley that his stock went up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because I, yeah. He, I said you, yeah. you got a little bit. I said you got a little bit of wedge on me now because. You got me in contact with Marshall Yonda, so I said I got to give you a little bit of credit for that. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Jason's a good dude. Yeah, yeah he is yeah. a good dude. Yeah, so. thanks for having me. Like I said, I mean, I'm always, uh, you know, always willing to give my time, and uh, it's a pretty cool place. You know, it's neat, uh, neat what you guys got going on, and uh, looking to help. And yeah, it's pretty cool. Well, appreciate we appreciate it. it. Yeah, really no appreciate problem. it. Yeah. See you guys next week for another episode. Yeah.